We have a wonderful jam-packed evening tonight, so I'm going to be quick in explaining how things work. This program is designed to demonstrate impasse breaking techniques in the context of both private and port annexed mediations. And we are going to be using various backgrounds throughout the evening, virtual backgrounds, to show the differences between the various contexts. When our backgrounds are white or marble, we're speaking out of role, we're neutral, just uh, like anybody else. When we, however, are in blue, as you see from my background now, we are in the private mediation context. When we are in red, we will be in the court annex mediation context, and um, we will be switching throughout the evening. Generally speaking, the program will run in such a manner that we will have a role play of about 20 minutes. The last one will be 15, so that's the exception, but 20 minutes of role playing for the private context, followed by 10 minutes of commentary by our esteemed panelists. And thank you all so much for your participation tonight. Uh, afterwards, which we're gonna do it again with the court annex context. So we'll be switching our backgrounds to go red uh, with 20 minutes in that context. And then afterwards we would have another 10 minutes of commentary. We'll be then taking a break We'll then have another scenario set out where we go 2010, 2010, another break. And then the last scenario will be court annexed only. Um, you can see the reasons why for that in the, in the fact pattern, which uh, has been set around. I encourage everybody to read the fact pattern, um, you know, if you can uh, during this. If you haven't, uh, let me give you a very brief breakdown of what this case is about. First of all, I want to uh, just bring forth a comment that Simeon asked me to make, and I think it's a very good one. This case was intentionally selected as a real life example of a case that was resolved successfully through ADR, but then also as one which could have been envisioned through a, a lens of mediation uh, as probably what's gonna be happening now as we go into the post COVID, hopefully soon completely post COVID, uh, who knows what, what's going on at any time, but the post COVID era when courts are now assigning and, and specifically I'm gonna mention Nassau County Supreme, they're not assigning any more cases which are just in the high realm commercial uh, you know, seven figure sphere, what they're doing now is actually assigning all civil cases. So if you take a look at the NASA County rules, which are at the end of the fact pattern, which we'll be using tonight, you'll see that the new vision uh, going forward for presumptive ADR is that at least in NASA County Supreme, all civil cases as of November 2021 are being assigned out to uh, presumptive mediation. Uh, again, there are obviously exceptions, you know, that justices can make if parties don't want, but uh, or if the justices don't feel the case is appropriate at the time. But generally speaking, the idea right now is that we're moving forward. We have these cases assigned. So the dollar figures in this case are not particularly high. That is, again, intentional. Um, however, the dynamics involved in the case, I could tell you if you look through the first couple of pages of the fact pattern describing what happened in real life. This case, notwithstanding the fact that it's in the five figures, was negotiated out over five hours. So there are a lot of different considerations that we want to bring forth. And again, you know, so one of the nice things about this case is that since it wasn't actually um, mediated, we have a way of figuring out hypothetically how things would have gone based upon our experiences. And by that, I mean Nelson Timken, who is going to be serving as our mediator tonight, Chris Fladgate, who is going to be serving as counsel for uh, Super Plumbing Incorporated. Uh, uh, Dorothy uh, Caldi is going to be serving, uh, playing the role of Charlene Collins, and um, Federico Romanelli is going to be playing the role of Zina Zarbo, all of the litigants in the council, based upon our experiences in both the private and the court annexed context, we're giving you what we think might have happened based upon our experiences from other cases in real life. So we're trying to make this as real life as possible. One word also about caucuses, we've experimented uh, at length, and we are going to try tonight, if there are any caucuses called, to make the caucus a true caucus, which means that we will be muting our speakers for the role players um, so that we will effectively be cut off. If anybody's interested in how we're going to terminate a caucus, someone will still be seeing our, our cameras will still be on. Whoever's in the caucus will hold up an envelope. And if you see from my thing, it says, says end caucus uh, is the signal to us. So that's how we'll be doing caucuses. I think it's the first time in one of these demonstrations that we're going to be doing this technique where people will actually be in a real caucus because we won't know what's happening and we will not be flies on the wall. Uh, we will actually have uh, just only our eyes uh, and not our ears. All right, with that, I'm going to uh, get into our first uh, role play. So uh, if everybody can turn in their packets to page six, uh, we're going to start there. And anything that's in black text happens to be neutral. Uh, anything that's in red text is court annexed the other way around. Anything that's in blue text is private. Anything that's in red text is going to be uh, court annexed. All right, scenario one, my way or the highway. 
After the parties and their counsel were signed a mediation agreement and submitted pre-mediation statements, both attached, the initial mediation session commences. For the first 20 minutes of the session, Mr. Timken briefly reviews the mediation agreement with the parties and counsel and makes an opening statement reminding them the elements of the mediation process, meaning that it's a confidential, facilitated negotiation focusing on the needs and interests over positional bargaining, creative option generational, uh, generation potential is encouraged, risk analysis and reality testing and caucuses may take place. And the many costs and efficiency advantages of mediation over other dispute resolution processes, including but not limited to litigation. Having finished this opening statement, and again, this applies to both contexts, so we're gonna start though with a private, but this also is the opening jumping off point for both. Mr. Timken is about to ask the parties as to how they wish to proceed when Mr. Weinreb intercedes. Nelson, thank you for your opening statement, but I want to remind everyone here that we're all on the clock one way or another, and especially so in Nelson's case, where he has already spent billable time preparing for today for which the parties will be charged. Neither I nor Ms. Zorba want to sit around singing Kumbaya and discussing our feelings or anything of a similar nature because this simply is not relevant. In this regard, here's what's relevant, what we need, all need to focus on, as I already set forth in Ms. Zorba's pre-mediation statement. First, SPI's case is meritless. Its workers were negligent and the company should not now be rewarded for this negligence. Second, Ms. Zorba has at least one potential counterclaim of significant merit here. Third, to put a quick end to this litigation, Ms. Zorba is prepared to write a check in the amount of $1,000 to SBI. Four, that's our final offer, $1,000 to SBI. Again, that's Super Plumbing Incorporated, plus the parties exchange of mutual general leases. Chris, I would imagine that you'll need some time to discuss this offer with your client, Ms. Zorba, and I believe five minutes to be sufficient starting now. And after six minutes, so that's going to be uh, when we get down to 11 minutes on our clock here, uh, your time is up and our offer is withdrawn. Time is ticking, so I suggest you move quickly. Counsel, I hear the frustration in your voice and I understand it. Uh, but, you know, a lack of participation will not make your client's problem go away. Um, I think the more heads that we get on this problem, the more likely we are to solve it. Don't you agree? Well, I'd first like to hear what Chris is going to say to our offer, because we believe this is a fair and reasonable resolution of this case, and we could all go home. Certainly. Well, we're, we're here to mediate. We're not here to be insulted, and that's what that offer is. Well, well, you, go ahead, counsel. I think then let's you know call it a day. Do you have anything to add? You have to understand that there are no sides in this conflict. The solution has to address both parties' needs. Please stay. Even if you would like to leave, uh, I'm asking you to please stay uh, uh, as a favor to me so that we can perhaps collaborate and reach a solution that's to everybody's advantage. Well, if you can do something in that regard, um, I'm willing to give it some time. We'll give it till the end of what we have over here. But uh, Ms. Zorba and I, we want to get this resolved and we want to get it done quickly. So, uh, you know, let's avoid the kumbaya stuff. And uh, Mr. Temkin, Nelson, do your job. I understand. Uh, at this point, uh, I think it might be uh, advisable for us to speak each side in a caucus. I have no objection, but who would you cool. like to have seen caucus? Uh, first, I would like to have the, uh, well, I mean, either side, whichever side wants to go first, that's fine. We were the first ones to speak. We'll let the uh, plaintiff have the first one. Okay. okay. Let's get a caucus. So, uh, Mr. Timken, just to start with, my, my client's having a few technical difficulties. She is here. Um, she just can't get a camera working. Um, but uh, Charlene is, is here. Um, that's fine. I'm I having a few health health <laughs> difficulties with pneumonia myself, so uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll all struggle through. Yeah. Um, Can uh, I just so, say something since, you know, it's my company? Sure. Absolutely. I can't believe that this guy schlepped us all here and now has us on a timer. That's so rude. All right. I just wanted to say that. Okay. So, Ms. Collins, is there anything that you would like to tell me that you perhaps would not feel, did not feel comfortable uh, 
stating in the room with everybody there? Um, it's my personal opinion of the uh, of the situation. I, I don't know if I, if I should say it now or later. But let's just, instead of inserting my, my opinion, let, I just want to tell you basically what happened. The story has been going on since uh, pre-COVID 2018. I mean, I did his work and he hasn't paid me. It's a very simple story. She hasn't paid me, rather. I heard that there was an offer of $1,000. You mean the insult of $1,000. Okay. Uh, and. My question is, uh, if I can get her to raise that offer, uh, would that be uh, assistive to you in terms of would you be able to uh, come to another uh, amount other than what you were seeking in the lawsuit? Well, I'd rather consult my attorney about that. This, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> You know, Nothing that you say here will be communicated to the other side without your approval. And everything that is said here is confidential. So with that in mind. I just feel like we're dealing with liars and cheaters. But, you know, <clears throat> I also yeah. understand that. Yeah, you know, our frustration here, Mr. Timken, is that they've only got two complaints about our work, uh, about my client's work. Uh, one complaint was was that we mixed up the hot and cold water pipes, um, and we fixed that promptly. So we we don't understand, and they're effectively saying that that's worth twenty one thousand dollars, because the other fifteen thousand they say was caused by the the cutting of the joists, which by the we way we had permission to do that. We, we had we were told to do it uh, by by the the project manager on the site, but. We, we, you know, there's $36,000 out there that hasn't been paid. There's, there's it's, no... It's a lot, it's not, it's, especially yeah, in, but, this age, in this age. Yeah, and it's just sat out there uh, on one of their, their, their heads of, of, I don't know, damages or reasons for not paying. They've said, um, you know, 21000 because the, the water pipes were the wrong way around, but no damage came from that, and we fixed it before anybody moved into the building. Um, so, you know... I've, I would have thought that they have to come up to at least twenty one thousand, you know, to pay that before before we even start negotiating. I agree. I agree. You know, raising them from one to two thousand or one to five thousand, I don't, I don't think that's going to cut much ice. You know, it's like the guy Zorba made the um, offer, and it, it really stinks of bad faith. Um, you know, already he hasn't, she hasn't paid me. It's been, it's been years. And now we're, we're in mediation, in mediation. I was shocked that they wanted to mediate, but I'm not going to mediate as an idiot. I'm not the enemy of my own money. Well, let me ask you this, ma'am. Uh, is, is the fact of having good quality work, something that you are interested in? Oh, obviously, and that, and, I, and that's another thing he's doing. He's also ruining my, my my reputation, the good name of my plumbing company, by asserting we did negligent work. I mean, our work is quality. And if this were to proceed in a lawsuit, which is a public forum, rather than a mediation, uh, would that have any worsening effect on your reputation? Do you think? <sighs> I don't know. Um, well, it's a balance, let me discuss right? It with my attorney. It, it, it's a balance because they haven't paid us, so we've already filed the lawsuit. Uh, so if they already... want to say we're negligent, we'll just say <laughs> that they're that they're thieves. Okay, <laughs> we can both well, ruin each other's reputation. I think it would be best if we if we keep things civil. I think you're more likely to reach a, a uh, an agreement uh, that way. But at this point, let me ask you this. Is there anything that you would like me to communicate to the other side as far as your interest in resolving this? It depends. I mean, what do you think, Chris? We can knock a little bit off the top. Like, as I said, we feel strongly on, on both fronts, but... We're here to mediate. If you want to knock something off the top below 36,000, we can do that. Uh, so there is some flexibility. 
is what I'm hearing. Am I correct? If they make a reasonable offer. Okay. All right. At this point, I think I should speak uh, to the other side and see what they have to say. So that's a good word. Okay. I'd like to meet with Ms. Uh, Mr. Ms. Zorba and her attorney at this point. In a caucus. In a caucus, yes. Fine by us. Okay. So, uh, counsel and Ms. Zorba, uh, is there anything that you would like to tell me now that would be useful to me in helping you that you didn't feel comfortable talking about in the room with everyone present? Well, I'll let Ms. Zorba speak for just a little bit regarding that, but this caucus is confidential, right? We're not... Uh, we're it's not confidential, be- and nothing that is said here would be communicated to the other side unless you give me authority to do so. Yeah, so you're not one of those mediators who basically communicates everything unless I tell you not to communicate. That's That sounds good to me. All right, uh, Zina, go right ahead. Well, there is not much more than uh, what you already know, right? So the story is uh, that uh, they asked us to pay. They asked me to pay for services that they didn't render. They didn't uh, um, do their job well, and uh, I had to incur in a lot of uh, expenses to remediate their mistakes. I feel I really should not be paying for anything. Yeah, and let me just add, there's additional aspects of the damages here that we set forth in the remediation statement that may just be ignored, but that's the delay, the six-month delay in the uh, building opening. When you have six units of rent, that's significant rent. It's actually more than the uh, difference uh, between what's ultimately uh, SPI received and uh, what they're asking for it, it's more than the thirty nine. It's more than thirty nine thousand one hundred fifty dollars. I think we've yeah, established that it's thirty six thousand six hundred fifty. But uh, you know, it's more than that. And we're not going to be necessarily asking for that. We want this case to go away. So a thousand dollars after we've, you know, uh, when we say we, I'm referring to obviously Zena. Uh, I identify with her as being her attorney. I uh, I think that it's very fair because uh, she's out of, of pocket for those six months not having rent. And this is pre-COVID. Now with COVID on top of that, it's a double win. But uh, the law is the law. You can't do anything about that. How did you arrive at the figure of $1,000? We figure that's about nuisance value for the case. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, they did something. You know, uh, they did uh, finally do something. So we figured nuisance value comes down to it. That makes sense. Uh, Really, probably... If we were really going nuts and bolts, you know, and really looking at the numbers, we'd probably say they should be paying us. But uh, in the interest of, of getting this resolved and time management and uh, with everything that's going on, and of course, uh, Zena's time being extremely valuable, we figured it's enough to, uh, to get by. But that's, uh, that's really as far as, as we're willing to go. Since you mentioned the issue of time, how much time do you feel it would take to bring this case uh, to resolution in the courts? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. I think it's probably going to take three years minimum. And with the delays and other things that I could put forward in terms of stonewalling is defense counsel. I mean, we already had one motion to dismiss that hit home. Uh, with that already as the uh, first strike against the other side, they conceded. They died on that one. They said they're not going forward. And I haven't even begun to fight in the words John Paul Jones here. Uh, I have seriously substantial merit-based defenses. Uh, We may not have procedural defenses, as I put forth in the pre-mediation statement, but we definitely have some major defenses as well as counterclaims that are of uh, significance if we have to assert them. Now, granted, those come at a cost. Uh, It's not like we haven't thought about this case beforehand. But uh, What do you estimate the cost would be for all of that? Well, based upon my experience over 20 years litigating various state federal courts, plus I really don't know what's going to go on with, with COVID, probably somewhere in the neighborhood, if I'm going to be generous, maybe I'll come some discounts, about you know, $40,000. Okay. And how much is the amount that they are seeking? Yeah, about, about that, 36650 after they made their adjustment. And 
Let but there's a ask. difference here. I mean, I mean, it's easy to say that, you know, as, as when looking at $40,000 is $40,000, but there's $40,000 split over three years, which has a completely different value of money than $40,000, which is me paid out in a lump sum. Plus then don't forget about that nasty 9% statutory interest that uh, comes along with that. Who wants that? That really brings their claim up to about $55,000 <laughs> when you do the math. Uh, we'll win, you know, and then of course there's the potential for recovering on the counterclaim. Now, granted, there might be some expert costs to go along with that, but then if you take those and split them up, amortize it over, you know, three years, four years, whatever it's going to be, we'll delay a little bit longer. Yeah, we'll just we'll wait them out. You mentioned over time. What if I could discuss with them the possibility of a payment plan or paying out whatever the agreed upon amount is over time? Would that work for you? Well. I don't think it's going to work for us in the way things are going right now, simply because of the way things are with COVID. Uh, let's take a look at what happened over the past year and a half. Xena uh, wasn't collecting any rent. As it stands right now, she's still having issues. The moratorium in Jersey might just have, have ended, but uh, the, the courts there are not going to be certainly receptive to any eviction cases <laughs> anytime soon. So there's no income coming in at this point. And she has other creditors, by the way, in terms of finishing up the building that are legitimate for what they did. A, a payment plan may make sense if, though, if, if SPI was in the same class as uh, those creditors where they actually did legitimate work and performed services. But here, they're seeking to be rewarded for their negligence. They messed up. <laughs> there's, there's very little in, in the way of, of, of defense on their side. Uh, maybe with the hot and cold water lines, all right, that they did mess up. They didn't have any response for that. But, uh, you know, all right, that wasn't such a big deal for fixing. Fine, you know, 5,000, 5, maybe 10,000 max for the time and, and what else. But the, the real issue was cutting through the joists. They caused structural damage to the building. Right? They destroyed the joists, not damaged the joists. They destroyed them. The joists from the pictures had to be rebuilt. All right. That cost in it itself $15,000. Plus, then you have the delay. Plus, then you have this time from COVID, and now you're asking Zena to pay? I, I mean, come on, Nelson. Are, are you sane? Ms. Zena, Ms. Azorba, uh, yes. are your apartments currently being rented? Um, no. Uh, we had to delay uh, people coming in. Uh, we, I think there is maybe some that have been rented. I, I need to check, though. Yeah, I had better. mentioned to, to your counsel, Ms. Zorba, the, the idea of perhaps being able to pay this whatever amount is agreed upon over time. Is that something that might work for you? Well, you know, as uh, my attorney was saying, I, I don't know because I really feel like I should uh, not be paying. I mean, they did something that they were not supposed to be doing. They uh, were supposed to fix the plumbing and they destroyed the joists. They are like structural part, part of the building. You know, that caused a lot of delays, damages. I hear what you're saying. And but they're trying that... to throw that, you know, Nelson, they're trying <coughs> to throw that on, on the contractor. <laughs> You know, even if, if there was some sort of order, maybe they misunderstood it, who knows? The point is, is that at the end of the day, you know, the uh, the fact is, is that you don't do that just as a matter of good practice. Uh, any any plumber in their right mind would know. And I, I have, you know, uh, diagrams, I have pictures of the way drilling holes are supposed to be done in a circular manner. They're not supposed to be cutting through the joists. They're supposed to be drilled to cause the least amount of damage. But has right? that so, all been rectified at this point? Uh, yeah, but at great cost. And that ends our first segment. All right, now we'll switch it over to our panelists. Okay, I'll start. It seemed that everything was kind of early and forced to be quick here. Um, I was struck by the mediator allowing um, Alan to, or the attorney, to um, to give $1,000 right from the get-go. I also wasn't sure whether there had been an opening session where the parties had an opportunity to speak and where there was active listening. Um, but I thought that allowing the thousand dollars to come out really fast, it's a very low number, um, especially according to the plaintiff, um, set the tone of having to 
to respond to that, um, it, it seemed like an aggressively low number. And maybe that set the tone um, it, it, on the wrong foot because the plaintiff then was saying they were lying and cheating. And maybe if they had had an opportunity to give their stories, they would have heard about, they would have been able to discuss the contractor. They might have heard about uh, delays, um, which seemed to be a really important function as well, and might explain the $1,000, which it didn't seem the plaintiff was aware of. So I'll stop there. Picking up on something Alita said, it did seem that we went into caucus very quickly. And uh, I'm I'm wondering, uh, just uh, full disclosure, I, I go to caucus very uh, reluctantly and slowly. Um, so bear that in mind. I just mediate in a different, I'm very facilitative. But um, uh, I, I, I had the sense that they went into caucus because of the aggression of um, Zorba's lawyer. And I'm wondering if the role players could tell us if they felt that. Did the, did the plaintiff side feel as if you, that, um, that the defense was setting the tone of the mediation because you went into caucus right after uh, or very, very quickly after the defense said, it's $1,000, take it or leave it, goodbye. I, I felt that it was a way to avoid conflict. Okay, it didn't it didn't feel to you as if the mediator was uh, bowing to the wishes of the defendant in that. No, I'm, I'm really asking. I don't know. So no. I, it was okay. Good. Let, let, let me interject here, being the counsel for defense. That was exactly my objective. I was trying to seize control over there, and Chuck, you hit the nail right on the head by basically doing that by forcing a caucus so early. I was trying to direct the way things that should be going. And uh, the fact that the caucus was called call that early, to me, indicated as counsel that I was gaining some traction because the mediator, to a certain extent, was put off about discussing these things in joint session. By the way, people are wondering why my image has changed. It's for the next uh, role, please. <laughs> Your image was a mess, a lot. I think um, Pierre has a comment. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, and it wasn't clear from the record that was given to us, uh, since it's a private mediation, I would have expected uh, the mediator to have had talks before the mediation session with each party to see what kind of an offer they might want to make. And, and, and you know, in that case, if, if, if uh, Elon had said as counsel, we're going to offer 1,000, I'd have been very you know, hard pressed not to comment that it's, it might not be the most appropriate way to, to move the thing forward. Uh, I don't know whether whether people feel the same way. That's interesting, Pierre. Um, it's funny, you know, I, I do a fair amount of talking in advance of a mediation. You know, we have pre-mediation uh, joint uh, pre-mediation conference calls, which we develop all kinds of things. Who's going to be there and the statements and um, get the nutshell of the matter and then have private discussions also sometimes uh, with counsel. But often we don't hear for sure that they're planning on doing an opening demand, at least in my experience. So we, maybe it could have caught him by surprise that when we invite uh, in cremation statements, in my practice anyway, is to invite not only facts, um, and uh, law only to the extent it's pivotal uh, to the negotiation or assessment of the matter, uh, but also inter-party dynamics and thoughts for the process and, um, you know, a variety of things, including settlement history and thoughts for settlement. So that that $1,000 number might have come out in a pre-mediation statement, um, you know, if not in, in the joint uh, or, or pre-mediation uh, conferences, but it sometimes could be uh, a total surprise. Um, I specifically, oh, I'm sorry, Simeon. No, go ahead, Alita. I'm, I'm wondering what people thought about, I mean, thought about that kind of shocker uh, coming out there, the demand, and what do you do? What do we do when somebody makes a demand we're not expecting, you know, you know, maybe hasn't sussed it out the way Pierre might have done it. But what do we do when somebody makes that hard demand? How do we respond to that? I might say Steve, it's really... I'm early. sorry, go ahead, Alita. I'm sorry, I might say it's really early to have that. I also 
tell the lawyers in those pre-mediation calls that I don't want to hear opening numbers at the joint session, at least until we've had a discussion about it for precisely that reason. And also because opening numbers can be the equivalent of what's in the complaint or in the answer, and they are um, they can estrange the other side, and it, it's not it's not productive. So I like to wait at least until one caucus. It's so funny, you know. I, you know, you know, I've done it. You know, we've all done a ton of these things. I have to say, it's extremely rare to find somebody jump out in in our opening sessions, even if they go for a long time, like an hour or whatever. Um, it's extremely rare for somebody to jump out with a. Here it is. We've got no time. Let's get down to it. Sometimes people say, let's get down to it. And that leads to discussion. Should we do it now or not? But to jump out like that. I know Steve Hockman has thoughts on, on what you do when somebody puts his bottom line out there like that. And particularly, uh, you know, one that might be seen as uh, offensive to the other party. So I, I'm curious, Steve, what, what you would what you would say. Uh, how do I? Um, oh, well. I try to coach them not to uh, come off to, to to come with something that's out of the ballpark of reality, uh, and uh, obviously you got to leave room for the back and forth negotiation, but not uh, off the wall in terms of asking too much. Because I remember one uh, defense lawyer used to say, "I can't even respond to that." Because if I came in with zero, they'd think the midpoint, you know, right away people think of the midpoint, and there's, there's no way I'd have to come in with a negative number. So part of it is to try to coach the parties not to uh, come in with an out-of-the-ballpark number. And, and one of the other questions I was asking Simeon, at the appropriate time, uh, I, I have this article called The Mediator's Proposal whether, when, and how it should be used. Um, is that something that can be circulated uh, when, because at, 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 it includes the 10 mistakes that even yeah. mediated sometimes. Steve, it was, it's actually part of the materials. It's part of the material. Part of the materials. Oh, okay. But, but Steve, what do you do when somebody says to you, listen, I'm starting out, let's not waste time. Here's my bottom line. And they give you their bottom oh, line. What well. do you say? Yeah, I always say thank you for sharing with me your present thinking um, because um, I don't want to insult them, but uh, I get that, uh, uh, you know, but they say, this is my bottom line and please, you know, don't tell anybody. Steve, and, you're, burying, you're burying, not the lead, you're burying the tail on that. It's, it's one of several lines I learned in your trainings that I use probably in every mediation, which is, um, Thank you for telling me your current thinking about your bottom line, about your final position. Um, and and the, it, that breaks the humor of it. It's, it's uh, because it never is anyone's bottom line. Um, and, and the point is, if we're here to have a conversation, don't be closed minded. By the way, Chuck, like you, I actually quote Steve during the mediations. All the time. I, I will say, I don't say, I won't say it. I won't say thanks for sharing with you your present thinking. I'll say, you know what? I'll train the media's for the commercial division, and there's this guy Steve Hockman, and you know what he says in these circumstances, uh, and uh, it just uh, it does just light, so it, it just so it the audience up. understands. Wh whenever I say it, I I credit Steve, and almost always people say, "Oh yeah, I've heard of him." <laughs> so. We move into our next segment, which is the court annex version of this. And uh, as you can see, I have a newspaper up for my image because that is the lead-in from the uh, materials. So we'll begin there for those people who are following along. We are on page seven of 10. All right, same uh, black text before. <laughs> I have held up a newspaper in front of my face to block the Zoom camera. Um, for those wondering, this really happened. It didn't happen with the Zoom camera, but it happened in real life at a court annex wrongful death mediation back in 2019, where I served as mediator on a 90 minute clock. And now we're in the court, minute, court annex context. So that comes into play here under the NASA rules that we're using. <laughs> Mr. Temkin, you've spent 20 minutes of the 90 that were required to be here blabbering about the nature and advantages of mediation. 
I appreciate the CLE time, but Ms. Zorba had to take off time from work today to be here when she could have been attending to building management. And I'm sure that Mr. Fladgate and Ms. Collins also have their respective business commitments to attend to. You have about 70 minutes more to go, which I'm timing out on a timer that I have going on my phone. Once that time is up, Ms. Zorba, whom I have directed to be as loquacious as a clam, and I will be leaving unless the final offer I'm about to make on her behalf to SBI is accepted. I'll get to that shortly, but first, as I told you at our pre-mediation conference, and I'm now stating this once again, I do not believe how court annexed a really court-ordered mediation can be thought of as true mediation because it's inherently self-contradictory. Neither Ms. Zorba nor I are here by virtue of our self-determination, meaning voluntarily. We would not be here but for the court's order of reference. And while I understand that the court has the power to compel our physical presence here, it cannot compel what arguments and positions Ms. Zorba is going to take just as it cannot do so at a settlement conference. In short, the court may have our bodies but not our minds. With that said, I'm withdrawing the offer set forth in Ms. Zorba's pre-mediation statement because that offer doesn't account for the attorney's fees that Ms. Zorba has incurred and is now incurring as we speak. Thus, Ms. Zorba's final offer now is that SPI, file, SPI voluntarily discontinue the case with prejudice pursuant to CPLR 3217A2 and pay Ms. Zorba $5,000 to offset her legal fees to date. Take it or leave it. Finally, Mr. Temkin, realize that no matter what happens here, you will not see a cent after the 90 minutes are up such that unless SPI accepts the offer I just put forth, you will have wasted your time here along with everyone else, although I do take solace in the fact that I'm going to get paid for today, and maybe Mr. Flaggate as well, if he's not working on contingency. Furthermore, if you think you can relate any of what I've just stated to the court's ADR coordinator or the court itself, even directly, think again. Mediation is confidential, as you've stated numerous times, and it's reflected in the court's ADR program rules and procedures. As such, if I detect one whiff of disclosure of anything I just said, I will not hesitate to commence a disciplinary proceeding in front of the appropriate grievance committee against you based on the fact that you will have lied to all of us about mediation confidentiality. As I'm sure you know, attorneys, especially those working for courts, are barred from making false statements under Rule of Professional Conduct 8.4c, which prohibits conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. So I would tread carefully here if I were you. In addition, I will, regardless of what happens with the Grievous Committee, notwithstanding what is in the mediation agreement or any court ADR rules and procedures, sue you for tortious interference with respect to my attorney-client relationship with Ms. Zorba, as well as for gross negligence. Granted, you might have immunity, but neither of the two quite public proceedings I mentioned will do wonders for your case settlement percentage or for your reputation as a mediator. So unless SBI takes Ms. Zorba's final offer, as I've just stated, I suggest you just let SBI up the floor until time runs out. In that regard, you have 66 minutes and 34 seconds remaining of the initial 90 minutes. Your move, Mr. Timken. Counsel, this discussion is becoming very polarized, which is not what I would like it to be. We have to find common ground before we can go any further. Uh, with respect to your lack of participation, of course, you're welcome not to participate. And of course, that will not meet with any commentary from myself, but I should let you know that the judges will see the length of time that the mediation took. And if it only takes a small amount of time, that will cause some raised eyebrows, irrespective of my saying anything or, or anything uh, that you might find to be objectionable. Objectionable. So uh, I, I just want to let you know that, uh, th that you, know, you have to be willing to give up the need to be right in any situation uh, and consider other viewpoints. And by not participating, you're not doing that. And that's what, that's what the process is all about. I would ask you to please reconsider and please consider participating in this and allowing your client to do so. We'll stay here for the 90 minutes until it runs out. And now you're down to about 64. But, uh, you know, that's what we got to do if the court says it. We really don't want to be here. I mean, why, why should we be compelled to mediate? What, what sort of uh, process is it when, when you're not being told that you can do X or Y, you're being told you have to do X or Y. You're being told that we have to be here in this environment. Granted, we didn't have to travel for this because it's Zoom, but we have to take our time. Uh, Ms. Zorba has to be inconvenienced by this. I have other things to do. 
you know, I want to litigate this case. I don't want to be here, but the court is basically putting a gun to my head and saying you either do this or you're going to be facing sanctions. So we're here, but we don't have to participate. Counsel, you and I are both constrained to follow the court rules. We have no choice. And I understand what you're saying, that you don't want to be here. However, how is remaining mute solving the situation before us? Oh, it's very simple. I get essentially get the benefit of a free deposition. That's how. Let them speak. Let them give out what's going to be the case. I'll know where they're coming from. That at least is a constructive use of my time. In order to get a deposition, you have to be there interacting with them. So even that won't be accomplished. No, I'll let you do it. By for remaining me. moot. I'll let you do it for me. You ask the questions. You think you you had have the major issues of the case. You let me think what how my how my case is really that bad, and then I'll go back to my client afterwards and tell her what I know all along that we're going to win this thing. I'm here well, to all guide questions. You. All questions that are asked of us will will demand to be answered in a caucus. So there goes your free deposition. I'm here to guide a discussion. I'm not here to ask questions on behalf of one party or another. I, I'm not uh, an advocate for either side, uh, as you know. So I'm not going to uh, be able to do what you're asking me to do. Uh, but I would encourage you again to participate. Uh, we have to find a common ground. and. It seems to me that your client uh, would rather, would like to resolve this situation in a manner in which she can afford. And I know that the other side is, is willing to do that. Can you please tell me what interest is served by, by not doing anything? It's very simple. It's through my litigation strategy and the way I want to run this case. That's but the this isn't litig but counsel, this isn't litigation. But it's in the shadow this of is, litigation. This is mediation. I understand, this but it's not, it's not mediation that I wanted. It's not mediation that Ms. Orba wants. Maybe the other side wants it, but it takes two to tango. Can you tell me why mediation doesn't serve your interests or no. those of your client? Because ultimately, you're going to use whatever tricks you have up your sleeve to coerce some sort of settlement out from my client by telling her about all the various advantages and what else about mediation that you spoke about in the initial 20 minutes. And in truth, well, I disagree with that completely. I've been litigating for over 20 years, and I can tell you the courts are the way to go. I don't want someone telling me and depriving, but to do it and depriving my client of her rights. And that's what's going on over here. My client is being heard, deprived of her right to access to the courts. What about her right to be heard? She can be heard she's in the courts. Up, she's giving up her right to be heard right here and now, isn't she? I don't disagree with that completely. I think she's actually manifesting her right to be heard in court by not participating in this. Why can't she be heard here and tell me if she doesn't wish to do it in, in, in conjunction with the other side? In, because in she very well might say something which is going to be used against her, not realizing that, you know, in the context of this might... Uh, might be misinterpreted by the other side. That's why. We've all signed a confidentiality agreement. Count. Yeah, but so what? <laughs> you really trust your, your adversary in litigation? Come on. Well, I just would ask your client to reconsider her position, not to say anything. Let me ask you a question. Why is it fair that my client has to spend money paying me for a process that we don't want over here. We're being coerced into this. This is not self-determination. This is coercion. The whole concept of mediation, as I said before, of being a court-ordered or court-annexed process being imposed upon somebody is directly contradictory to the traditional definition of mediation as being something which is voluntary. I am not here on a voluntary basis. I am your client allowed can, to take what... Your client can do this without you if she so desires. Absolutely not. No one is telling her that she can't. Are you trying to split or drive a wedge between myself and my client? Absolutely not. not but I'm just, I'm just. Yeah, she could do that also. She could also just cave into everything that the other side wants. I'm just addressing what you just said about the Let's need to Let's look at the other side. The other side in their pre-mediation statement wants $35,000. They want $35,000. 
dollars, all right, to be rewarded for their negligence. If My client is about major money, all right? It makes absolutely no sense. What they're coming back with to us is just insulting. This case is not appropriate for mediation. It should never been brought over here. The only reason why we're here is because, through no fault of your own, the court decided to say, well, let's turn it to an order of reference because Judge DeFiore out in Albany decided this is the way that we should be dealing with things right now, and judges shouldn't be doing their jobs. Rather, they should be handing it off to people like you. Now, in another context, maybe if we were closer together in terms of what went on over here, fine. But you know what? I'll give you one last shot over here. So we have a, a I little understand bit of time that this. you're not happy with that amount. Please tell me, what amount would you be happy with? Oh, what we just said. $5,000 paid to us, and we go home. <laughs> well, that's I, rational. How do you feel your adversary would respond to that? Oh, well, he'd probably say, I'm out of my mind. He'd probably come up with something to say that I haven't developed the counterclaim significantly, and that in reality over here, you can't have recovery because of various legal doctrines. Maybe the statute of limitations is in play as you put out. All right, yeah, that's, we could argue that, but I have answers for that based upon what happened in the terms of the tolling. And as well, he might even, uh, even though it wasn't in his pre-mediation statement, he might decide to invoke the economic loss doctrine. But guess what? I got answers for that too, all right? The fact is, is that I've thought out this case beforehand. All right. I, I know what's coming up. And what's re reasonable and rational over here is that my client not get shafted. Can you absolutely guarantee that you would win this case at trial? No litigator ever could. Any litigator who guarantees anything is, is completely out And of there's always a chance that the other side might prevail. Yes, correct? fine. So good. So, uh, you want quant quantification of numbers? I'll give you the numbers. 95% we're going to win. What about the 5%? Yeah, what about the 5%? Okay, well, let's see what happens in the 5%. Play it out. Isn't it 5% worth... ends up winning. They, they end up getting a judgment, right? They're going to go and, and collect against my client who's struggling to pay her bills right now with a bunch of other creditors. They're going to have to get in line, all right? Chances of them getting an actual judgment in terms of time is probably going to be three years because of COVID and, and everything else that's going along. The what if is, some is accommodation judgment, could be they're made? They're going to have to go after her to try to collect. So what if some accommodation... as well. What if some accommodation could be made? to allow her to pay the agreed upon amount over time. Well, you know, I know something I told her not to say anything, but I'm pretty confident that I have her authority to say, yeah, you give us 50 years, five, zero. We'll give you, you 50, 50, 50 years, 50 years to pay, 50 years to pay out your, your, your $35,000. You want that? Fine. How do you feel years. the other side would respond to that? Oh, they say, well, never mind. But you see, the 50 years at least has some basis and rationality. And that basis is that it's the nuisance value just spread out over time. We took $1,000, which was an original pre-mediation statement offer, and we take that and we go over for 35 years. And then we take the value of that you know, over time, since it's a large sum, we got up to $50,000. That at least makes sense. You know, $50,000 we would pay, sorry, $35,000. $35,000 we'd pay over 50 years. All right, that's less than $1,000 a year. And I think my client could very easily ha hack that. And by the let time me, we end up paying, the other side is dead. Let me hear from the, the counsel for the other side. Uh, well, Mr. Mr. Weiner seems very concerned about attorney's fees uh, being here today, but he seems to have spent most of his time looking up the court rules to avoid actually engaging in the arbitration. Um, he's also doing a great job trying to run out the clock here. Uh, you know, we we didn't choose to come here, but we're we're, we're prepared to to do a deal on the right terms. But it's it's yeah, you know, we're not seeing anything come from the other side. This is you know, <laughs> it's frustrating. Uh, we understand the opportunity cost of not getting a settlement done today. Um, the one thing I would say is that you know, taking this to trial, um, I don't know, 60, 70 hours of time to go in. And we're here for 90 minutes today. Uh, as a percentage, kind of makes sense to see see what happens today. And if we don't settle, so be it. But let's try to give it a shot. If you're given lemons, I think it's a lot better to make lemonade than to spread the bitterness all around. Everybody can't be right. And who is right is irrelevant. What is relevant is the fact that we need to reach some agreement
that is acceptable to everybody and serves their purpose. That's a beautiful homily, but here's the fact, Mr. Timken. This case involves us having lemons, and we're going to be still left with lemons. All right. The fact is, is, is that it makes no sense whatsoever for my client to pay anything to reward negligence at this point when she has already paid. This is not one of those cases I put in the pre-mediation statement, which is where the contractors have been completely stiffed. All right. They got the, the work that they did, which was done up to snuff and what else they got paid for. But come on, that has to be put on the table. They never the acknowledged it. They've paid us less than a third of the contract. Okay, all the work's been done. Like this is, and we are getting stiff. Damages you know, this that is, have been This caused? is a case of an owner deciding how much they just, they want to pay a contractor at the end of a job and, and making up reasons not to pay them. That, that's all this case is about. Um, uh, reasons, yeah. Look at the photographic evidence. Those reasons enough. Those cut joists, yeah. Okay. The your project you manager know, told us to cut. Yeah, but you never should have done that in the first place. If a surgeon is told by some other person, uh, let's say, uh, you know, a higher, more experienced surgeon or uh, someone who has more uh, education to go and, and to put take a scalpel to someone's heart when the surgery is supposed to be on someone's arm, is, does that make it proper because the other person said but so? I, I'm just following counsel, words. You're using aren't we here, the surgeon's in charge, yes. Can I ask a question? Counsel, aren't we here to look at the future, not the past? What's done yeah. is done. The future is completely messed up for my client at this point. She's paying off her creditors. She's in a hole. And now she's going to be in more of a hole based upon this case. You want to look How at the can future? we help her? How uh, very can we simply, help her? Very simply, give, her, give us the, the money that she, to offset some of the losses that she incurred. Uh, the SPI goes home. She starts paying off the people who she legitimately owes money to. And hopefully maybe gets her uh, tenants back in order, all of them at this point. Uh, who knows what's going to happen with COVID, but at least that's the way to look to the future. But work was done. And a jury may look at this case. In my experience, you never know what a jury is going to do. A jury may look at this case and feel that the contract is entitled to substantial money for the work that was done, albeit not done in exactly the manner that was desired. Isn't that true? Doesn't that happen? Can, anything's possible. Exactly. Of course it's going to happen. Like, like exactly. the defendant here has the benefit of our work. And why would you take the, the risk? On that forever. Counsel, why would you take the risk of having that happen after expending all that money over litigation expense? What makes you think that this case is even going to get close to a jury? We're going to kill this case on summary judgment. Yeah, and we'll, we'll refile it. With... With with differing, yeah, after, with I differing, get, after I get a dismissal on prejudice and a victory on what, what, counsel, what we are with differing up uh, with differing opinions on exactly what happened and the quality of the work, what chances do you feel there are to have summary judgment when there is a disagreement as to what exactly happened? Case is simple. Don't, ju don't judges is, usually deny summary judgment? Yeah, but not in this right? case. In this case, the, the case is simple. If, if we have a counterclaim on there for negligence, maybe we'll be going to force this into trial because of the fact that negligence usually does not result in summary judgment uh, adjudications. But right now, what we have is just a simple classic set of breach of contract claims, breach of contract, uh, just enrichment and account state. If Those you were in your adversary's shoes, judgment. if you were in your counterpart's shoes, what would you feel right now? Right now, I would say that I got something that client got something for what ultimately that corporation did they shouldn't be getting anything more for their shoddy work and at this point i would tell them it's not just worth it anymore to, to litigate it's going to take forever to go through the courts anyway is that is that actually how you would feel you're saying that ultimately i'm not being truthful with you yes yes that's how i would feel wow I don't know how uh, Nelson remains as unflappable in tone uh, with the provocations he uh, got from uh, Elon. That was really astonishing. I worked in the um, court system for 28 years. <laughs> I've heard it all before. So, you know, I mean, there, I've got a bunch of things. If, it, if people can tolerate my just taking a couple of minutes here, a bunch of things I'd like to comment on. I mean, some some immediate ones is why not ask him? take down the uh, newspaper. 
Uh, and and that generally, you know, when we do openings, and you know, now this is this is a scenario. You know, this is artificial. So of course, you know, Nelson is you know playing it uh, according to that. But naturally, we might we might open up a mediation, talk with people, have all the faces up on the screen, be talking with those people in advance, ask them how they're doing. You know. Uh, you know, has COVID treating you and that sort of thing, and break through an attorney's uh, monopolizing of, of uh, the, the discussion, particularly here in, in this caucus, uh, to get past some of this. But, but putting that aside, I, I wanted to share um, what we've got here is a challenge that's a structural challenge in part that's created by the well-meaning courts in, in, in creating a time limit. Uh, for court next mediation. The reason for the time limit is, is that we, we, the courts don't feel comfortable forcing people into mediation uh, and forcing them to pay. Uh, so as a compromise, there's a 90 minute period where the parties go into mediation and they don't pay until after the 90 minutes, but they're free to leave. That way the court's not forcing parties to pay for, for justice or, or a deal. Um, and so uh, this, but with that good intent to promote mediation that way could cause this scenario, which we're seeing in very extreme form be, being played out here. Um, now, I will say, uh, based on my experience for many years uh, working in the New Jersey um, CDR program, Complementary Dispute uh, Resolution Program, where they do thousands and thousands of cases a year get sent out to mediation there. And they've had a three-year, and then a three-hour, then a two-hour uh, window. Just as here, we have a ninety-day window. I, I've had certain approaches that I'd like to share. Secondly, uh, the same could be true here in the New York system. But for this kind of problem and a number of these impasse type of problems, I just wanted to share a quick uh, Zen story. Um, two dozen centuries ago. The 12, yeah, no, no, a dozen centuries ago, there was um, a, a Zen master, Shakujo, who was looking to pick uh, the head of, of a monastery, uh, an abbot of a monastery. Um, and he was debating between the head monk uh, and, um, and, and the head cook. And, and so he called uh, the assembly together and put a picture uh, on uh, the floor of the rostrum, and and he said, uh, he said, uh, do not call this a picture. What do you call it? So the head monk uh, uh, said, well, we can't call it a wooden uh, sandal. Uh, and then the the head of the cook, the head cook, came up to the rostrum, kicked the picture over, and, and left the stage. He, he was the one who got appointed as the abbot of, of, the, uh, of, of the, uh, the new monastery. Plenty of times we find ourselves with structural problems uh, and we could try struggling with them. We, we also can find ourselves with obstinate people like Elon um, and we could struggle with them. If we do, we're going to get stuck. We're going to get stuck in the very framework uh, that's creating the problem. So what we did see there, in, in however gentle and warm manner Nelson could summon, uh, was he was kind of arguing with this lawyer who was a big pain in the neck. So a way of getting around the 90-minute problem that I found in New Jersey is first have a call with, with the lawyers and say, listen, guys, uh, you know, I'm the serious mediator. I'm here, I'm giving my time, and in that instance, for free. Um, but I'm, I'm not doing it for nothing. So I'll commit to doing this mediation, but I need you to commit to stick it out. And no one's looking at the ringing the bell. I'm not going to ring the bell when the time passes. I don't expect you to ring the bell. We're here to try to get something done. We have that conversation before the mediation and, and conversations along those lines. And they get a sense, along with all the other things that I mentioned in the previous uh, session, section, uh, they get a sense that this is a for real opportunity. And deep down, despite uh, Alain's show, 
lawyers want, by and large, to help their clients. So um, if we reach them, if we show them the possibility, if we get their eyes focused on the end goal, we, we avoid that conflict. So that's the 90-minute problem, and it's the, the motivational problem. Uh, similarly, when you're in the scenario like that, rather than fight with the lawyer, um, just, just talk to other people. Push, push the guy aside through, through deflection, which is not engagement. Speak directly to the client. They're in, in, in the process there in a way where it's natural. So I know I've taken up far more of my time than I should have in this segment, but I just wanted to share that uh, with people. Just, I'd like to follow up on something that Simeon said. I was wondering where the parties were because it was dominated by the lawyers. I agree that getting rid of the newspaper would have been a really important first step. And then I was struck when Elon said that he just saw this as a free deposition, which is completely contrary to the court's expectation and for anything relating to mediation, not just because of the confidentiality rules, but because there's no effort then to try and resolve it. So I do have those preliminary conversations with lawyers in both um, regular private cases and court cases, because a lot of times you're right, lawyers are resentful and they don't want to be in mediation, but their clients are usually much happier to be in mediation than litigation, which just brings me, and then I'll stop. Um, someone raised in the, in the, uh, questions and answers. Why not form a wedge between the lawyer and the client? Because the lawyer here was being really difficult and obstinate. And my feeling is you never want to drive a wedge between a lawyer and a client because the client is trusting that lawyer. They're paying that lawyer. They have the relationship with the lawyer. They're trusting the lawyer to bring them to a happy conclusion. And if you alter that or alienate the client from the lawyer, the case is not going to get resolved because the client has no basis to trust you at that point. Is It, it may be floundering on an island that's broken off from a glacier. So um, so I would try not to do that, but I would have also looked at the whole point about the deposition. And uh, um, again, the, the lawyer is dominating everything, which is not how this should be. Um, maybe it's a time to go into caucus and then come back. And I'll stop with that. Thank you. So I could jump in with a couple of things. <clears throat> it's Chuck Newman. Um, Number one, um, Nelson, I don't know what drugs you were taking for the flu, but I want some. I don't know how you did that. Um, it, it, that was, it, I, I think it was incredibly important how calm you were, how your voice never changed, how you did not rise to the bait. Uh, and, and some of it, um, both in this session and the earlier session, were, uh, were uh, um, over the top. Um, I think it's important to say, and I see in the participant list, there are people who are attending this who uh, who I would call, uh, who I respect as mediators, and I would call for help with an impasse question. So um, I know many of you know this, but there are other names I don't recognize. And just to make sure all the attendees understand, the chances of your seeing a lawyer behave the way Alan just did are very, very small, particularly if you've done pre-mediation phone calls, you're going you're gonna to suss this stuff out earlier than that. Um, and uh, it just, they, they, I just don't see that lawyers behave that way. Uh, they understand it's counterproductive. If mediation is a party-centric process, and it is, it is always a party-centric process, no matter how strong and powerful and, and uh, reliable the lawyers are. Um, the, the, the parties in this last uh, scenario did not say one word. And um, a, 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 a counter, uh, uh, imagine another way of handling this might have been to say, uh, Alan, I understand you don't want to be here. Um, I don't know how your client feels about that. I'd, be, I'd love to know how your client feels about that. But um, I would appreciate it if you didn't keep forcing the fact that you don't want to be here because you don't have to be here. The court rules allow you to um, uh, get an exemption from the uh, presumptive ADR process. And if you had asked the judge not to be here and told him what you just told me, the judge would have excused you. You didn't do that. What do you recommend we do with this 90 minutes since you consented to be here for those 90 minutes? How do you see our best using them? Thank you, Chuck. That's great, great, 
great advice in terms of turning around and uh, turning the tables on someone who's super aggressive. First, what Chuck was saying before about, generally speaking, lawyers approaching mediation, what you're seeing here is not to them. Right? What you're seeing here is the outlier. And I'm showing you what was the most extreme conduct that was ever witnessed, although some of the things that were said, uh, specifically with respect to the grievance committee, by the way, where it's actually directed towards me in real life. The other stuff was a little bit uh, exaggerated for purposes of showing what <laughs> lawyers could, could ultimately do. But just so everybody sees this, where people who are coming up through the ranks you know, and getting experience, you're not going to find this very often, uh, lawyers behaving like this. The fact is, is it could still happen. And that's why I'm exhibiting this, because it's not your typical scenario. And I want to give some people over here, and I think everybody on our, not just me, the role players as well, we also want to give everybody a, a sort of a sense of what could potentially happen, just so that if it does happen, for whatever reason, you're ready for it in the, uh, in the offside case. But Chuck, you're, you're 100% correct. Also, with respect to what you just said before, I agree with you. That's the way to handle that. I think if I were sitting in Nelson's shoes, and uh, by the way, kudos to you, Nelson, uh, I would, uh, for, for taking all of that, unfortunately for you, by the way, just a heads up for preview, there's more to come. But um, uh, in the core dynamics context, but if I were in uh, Nelson's shoes over here, I would do exactly that. I would say at this point, you know, you have your 90 minutes here. You're going to be uh, ultimately uh, using them the way that you see fit. You have the right to, you know, I want power uh, from one standpoint. You have the right to do whatever you want under the rules. And what you're doing is not actually against the rules, but you're taking an opportunity here and just letting it go. It's not being very productive. And usually most lawyers in, the, in that case will, will do that. In the case that I had, well, what ended up happening was that the other side wanted to talk, uh, although that was the, the party that you know did it. It wasn't just the other lawyers. The other side's lawyer was all the happier to let the client talk. It was a good practice for her. And uh, she did uh, until the 87th minute, whereupon the other lawyer put down the newspaper, packed up his bags and left. And she then broke down into tears. So uh, that's the end of the, the real life story for them. For uh, those people who may have come on a little bit late, um, we are uh, in scenario two now, all right? That is a matter of trust. What uh, the goal of this exercise overall is to do is aside from showing various impasse uh, scenarios is to give mediators an idea of the two contexts which are coming up. Will necessarily uh, these types of scenarios develop in every single court annex mediation versus every private one? Is there a true difference between the two of them? Certainly in, uh, a question for debate amongst our panelists. I'm sure we'll hear various views. I know there are some panelists who say there really is no difference between the two contexts. Mediation is mediation. You go for with other, you know, as you see fit. On the other hand, there is the issue of the rules, you know, being bound by that. And that's what, to a certain extent, we have now with presumptive EDR, learning to live with them and to deal with them. So that's the idea behind these scenarios. But within the global picture, there are actually objectives, all right? So uh, as my way or the highway might have suggested, uh, this actually was a cue from Simeon's article, which is in your materials, on sausage making laid bare, which uh, deals with the concept of the hard negotiator. Now, in that article, the, the disputes which are involved are way more complex than you have over here. You have a multi-party dispute. I believe it's 10 parties, which are illustrated up to 20. So the dynamics there are completely different than we have, but you still have the idea of hard negotiation. So scenario one, as we started, was hard negotiation. What do you do with someone who's a hard negotiator? Scenario two, um, with scenario one, court annex was hard negotiator plus, all right? We're now going to be moving in to give everybody a preview of what's coming up with scenario two being a matter of trust. Uh, trust is integral to the mediation process, and um, you need to have it in two levels, a level between the parties and the mediator. Uh, which is actually going to be the focus of the court annex context and trust in the context of the parties to the parties. Uh, the parties can trust each other to some degree to actually come to a deal. So that's going to be the preview for our next selection. Again, um, in people are going to follow on the fact patterns. If you want to read through them, I strongly recommend it because there's a lot of detail you know, that's uh, involved in this case, even though it's pretty much a straightforward case as to whether or not they did the work or, or what else. But the uh, there are other emotional issues that are going to be coming out. We are going to be hearing, by the way, more from the parties now in the uh, next two sets of scenarios. But uh, the lawyers will still be taking a role, uh, certainly in the, uh, the court annex context, where we see it. The article by Simeon uh, on the technique of no technique yes. is Count a very check. helpful yes. article mm -hmm. for the next section. Yes. And also, if I could... I, it's basically the technique of establishing trust 
and of basically biting your tongue a lot, which was demonstrated, I think, to some degree by me in the last uh, role play. I want to answer, if I may, just quickly, uh, Richard's question. And Richard is an extremely experienced mediator, and we're, we're honored to have him here. The question of why I chose not to um, repeat, you know, loop or reframe <clears throat> some of the things that were going on. And, and that was basically a strategic decision not to parrot something that might cause increased animosity between the parties. I, I did not want to, and I obviously would have to change it drastically so that it would be palatable. And I just felt under the circumstances, it was better not to do it at all. Just, just a decision that I made. And I'm going to also answer very quickly, Gerald Ross's two very good questions. First, why wasn't there more preparation of counterclaim facts by defense counsel? You need to support the $1,000 offer. This is referring to the private context. The answer to that has to do with the way that the, sta the stage of this case, which was brought out. Um, had there been further development in the actual litigation and not gone out, I would have probably, as defense counsel in real life, forced more of a development. The problem is, is that when it comes to things like Joyce, uh, you have owners saying whatever they want to say. You have contra contractors saying whatever they want to say. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to how much damage is really caused and whether or not there's future lost profits, you know, and consequential damages, whether or not those are recoverable is a whole other issue. So the answer was uh, to that question, uh, Gerald, is that because the case was such an early stage, we ended up getting to a point where we just decided that, uh, it wasn't going to be cost effective in real life. But had the case progressed further, it probably would have been more development of it, assuming that it would have been cost effective in terms of hiring an expert. Your next question, what was the purpose of attacking the mediator? And this one I definitely want to address right now. The purpose of attacking the mediator in the court annex context, when I've been personally attacked, just like I tried to show uh, everybody what happened to me to some extent, is simply this, torpedo the mediation process by emotionally destabilizing the mediator. It is effective with respect to people who are coming up the ranks who are not used to being attacked. If you are used to it, like Nelson is, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing in this case, I think it's a very good thing. Whether you're used to it, that's one thing if you come from that from that disposition. But coming up from training, all right, from basic training and advanced training, you're taught that the parties, if they're given the incentives, if they're given the, the ability to do that, they will ultimately be brought about to the process. You sell it, you cheerlead the process, you give them the advantages and what else. There are scenarios where attorneys are actively hostile to the process. They take that anger towards the process itself. They deflect it to the mediator because the mediator is the representation of the process. The mediator is, the mediator is the embodiment of the process. And that's the result of you seeing attacks directly against the mediator. Does it serve any substantive purpose to the case? Absolutely not. Is it completely counterproductive to the overall process of mediation, as well as maybe the dispute resolution processes in general? Absolutely, yes. But at the end of the day, this is what attorneys have done, uh, again, in extreme cases, you know, with res respect to me, um, in the court annex context. They tried to do it. Um, once or twice, they've, they've succeeded. I have to say the grievance committee uh, complained when it, it came out to me that the grievance committee threat, that did throw me for a loop. I was never expecting that in a, in a million years. But on the other hand, we worked things out. I actually did have a long talk um, pre-mediation. All right, uh, with, the, with the attorney, and I reminded him of that long talk after he said that. He didn't put down the newspaper, but at least he was civil, if we could use that term. Okay, we are about to move into our next set of scenarios. Again, a matter of trust for the uh, people who are following along. We are on the uh, packet. We are on page 8 of 10. A matter of trust. In both the private and court annex mediation context, the parties have moved along in the process to the point where they are about to exchange offers, and SPI's counsel, in a rare move for a plaintiff's counsel, has been the first to request a caucus. And again, this is entirely unscripted, so I had no idea that Chris was going to request a caucus in the first scenario. Returning to the fact pattern, in the court annex mediation context, by virtue of his incredible skill as a mediator in the grace of God, Mr. Timken has managed to persuade Team Zorba to stick with the mediation process for at least an additional 90 minutes past the minimum 90 minutes provided by court ADR program rules and procedures by charging one half of his hourly billable rate to the parties for that time. The tick-tock of the clock has seemingly stopped, or at least is not as audible as it once was. However, any joy over progress which has been made up to this point is short-lived insofar as right before moving to caucus, Charlene Collins blurts out the following. 
You know, this woman, uh, this Zena and, and her company, I can't trust them. She's a bitch. She's a liar. I, I, I don't understand. They bring us here to mediate. They schlep us here. And then she, she gives us this offer of $1,000. I mean, come on. Did she bring us here to insult us? She's not honest. She argue, She she She's acting in bad faith. Miss Collins, Miss Collins. Excuse me. I'm talking. I, I, even, I know, but, you know, we agreed when we began that we were going to be civil to one another. And okay, fine. I, I, I would just ask that you please be civil to everybody. Fine, fine. I know that there's a lot of pain in your voice. I can hear it, but please be civil. Thank you. Very All right. Much. I apologize to everyone. Um, but, and the, but the, the overarching thing I want to say is that even if we were to come to some reasonable agreement, not this one $1,000 BS. Oh, sorry. Um, but um, how do I know that if, if, if she signs the agreement, she's actually going to obey it? I mean, what if she just says, okay, this is, this is agreement we have and I'll see you in six or seven months and not, and I get not a dime. I mean, come on, this has been going on since, since 2017. And, you know, it was pre COVID. Now we have COVID and, I don't know about her, but I'm sure she's suffering financially as I am. So, yeah, you know, that's all I have to say. Well, I'm totally disgusted. Charlene, I just want to, if I can, uh, can I just answer your question? Generally, mm -hmm. these agreements are reduced to writing and enforceable in court. So any so agreement that, that is reached will be enforceable. So if she doesn't pay, okay, then yes. I can take her to court? The the agreement can be reduced to a judgment, and and then you can take whatever steps. I'm sure your attorney will in, enlighten you as to what, what can be done. I don't want to step on his toes or supplant his, his role in this. We um, shall see. I just don't trust them. As, as, I, as I said, I, I know that you're in pain. If, if something like this had happened to me, I would feel the same way that you do. Uh, but that having been said, can we try to look at what might work for you in this situation in order to reach some consensus here? Can what you give me work? some idea of what would might work? Yeah, what would work would be if he came up, she came up with a reasonable offer. Okay, if I can get her to raise her offer some. Um, Not would, some, significantly. Would that, would that motivate you to do likewise? If I'm it's hoping you'll say yes. <laughs> all right, all right. If it's reasonable, I just don't want to sit here talking to myself or to my attorney because I'm paying him and his time, my time, everyone's time. Okay. Is your attorney there? Of course. Okay. I'm here. Okay, Mr. Attorney. Um, would that work for you as well? If I can attempt to get the offer raised. Uh, I'm talking now about a linked offer for those of you who read the materials. Um, if I can get the offer raised, if I can impose upon them to do that, would that work for you guys? It would, but with the usual caveats of we, we can't be doing midpointing. Um, we can't be uh, agreeing to do it in lockstep. If they go up 5,000, that's not a... But, counsel, you have to realize, and I apologize for interrupting, you have to realize that Rome wasn't built in a day. Oh, we realize that. Negotiations take time. And uh, that being the case, we may have to work this out in steps. But baby steps still get you to the same destination. It may just take a little bit longer. So would that work for you? In, in concept, yes. Okay. So let me see what I can accomplish. I'm going to ask that we end the caucus and see what I can accomplish on the other side. Uh, look. I'm going to ask you, please, to just hear me out for a moment. I know you're skeptical, but just listen to what I have to say. Uh, 
any negotiation takes movement on both sides. And nothing in life is guaranteed. Look at the situation we find ourselves in today. If, uh, if you guys would be able to move up a bit on your offer, I may be able to get the other side to move down. And that would save you a lot of legal costs uh, and, and time, which is one thing that we can never uh, have enough of. And I'm asking you if you would speak to one another, and I certainly would be happy to leave to let you do it. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Zora, uh, Zorba, would you speak to your counsel and then let me know uh, if you guys would be willing to move a bit so that I can try to get the process of resolving this matter going? I want to just before we do that, I think that sounds like a, a certainly a viable suggestion. But uh, before we get to that, there's a little bit of an issue that we had, which is this severe mistrust uh, that was articulated by Charlene Collins before with respect to my client. But counsel, counsel, I, I, I don't I don't mean to interrupt you, but I think that harping on the past is going to be counterproductive for us. Uh, and, and I would ask that you please bear with me in focusing on what we can do at this point in time. And I, and I agree with you in that. That's why I held my tongue there before. But I want to also point out that my client has been paying off her other creditors. I understand uh, and as that. A result, that, and that, that's, that shows some trust there. That shows that she, she's a trustworthy person. I understand so I, I, that. I, I want you to understand that. And I think she wants you to understand that. I understand that, and I, I do understand that she's been paying off other creditors whose claims she feels are more legitimate than this one. Did I, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So I, I assure you that I have been listening, and I do understand exactly where you're coming from. So what I'd like to do now is to let you guys talk privately and see if we can start the ball rolling here. Okay, let's end this caucus. Okay, so now I would like to hold a caucus with um, Mr. Fladgate and uh, with Ms. Collins. Where are we at? Okay, so I did ask them to speak and see if we could move the offer up so that we can begin the process of working this out. As I told them, you know, the things begin slowly and gather steam and eventually you end up getting there. It may take some time. So I would like to ask you to consider doing the same thing and speaking amongst yourselves and determining what exactly it is that you would want out of this situation in order to resolve it amicably. Okay? Does anybody have any questions, anything you want to tell me before we go back? Shelley? I don't know. We'll see. It's, uh, it, we'll see. We'll see. I'm willing to go back and try, but we'll see. I, I, I'm not positive. I'm not negative. I'm going to try to see what happens. Okay. Keep the faith, please. All righty. We're going to end this caucus now. Okay. So we're going to go back into caucus to see where we are right now. Okay. Okay. So I know you've had time to speak. Um, please give me a sense of where we are. All right. We have some very limited maneuverability. I think you have to understand something, and I want to put this out in caucus uh, because I don't want the other side really hearing this. But right now, with COVID having completely smashed uh, Zena's business, 
what's going on right now with her is that she's in a really tough place. Uh, the, the I man understand has, that. Uh, uh, so I'll tell you, I don't know if, if you do, but she's told me, and she's authorized me to tell you this, that she's not sleeping at night. All right? She's got bills piling up. She don't know, doesn't know what's going to happen with the building that she and her father worked on for so many years. Uh, the future is anything but certain with Omicron raging across the entire United States right now, never mind the tri-state area. And she's just really worried. Right? That's, that's one thing to consider. But in addition to that, right, and having to allocate resources amongst the various creditors, uh, there's just the reality of life. Uh, Nelson, I'll, I'll just tell you right off the bat, at some point, there's just not going to be money. Right? There's just not going to be money that's there. And you know, it may not be what the other side is going for. You know, they're coming in at 35,000. I mean, come on, you've been around the block before on this. You, you know that that's really uh, unreasonable to start out with. But we can come up, but, but it's not really going to be that much. You know, we'll start out, you know, with 1,000. We'll come up to 4,000. Okay. Now. It gives you some movement, but I mean, really, after that, it's not a matter of, of we can't pay it and what else. Now, you may ask, you may decide to ask for her financials, you know, whatever the case is. If it's going to be done in confidence, I'll tell you, I'll represent you as her counsel that uh, Zena will give you her, her uh, LLC's, uh, you know, financials for the for the uh, building so you can see what we're saying. I, is true. I don't think that would be necessary. And Ms. Zorba, I'm really sympathetic to what you're going through. I, I understand that we live in extremely tough times, um, and I appreciate very much your coming up with a, a higher offer to try to uh, negotiate this thing uh, so that we can put it all past us. And Zena, um, you have kids in school, right? Also, that you're you're having to deal with with COVID and them in school, and there's a, a tremendous you know pull on you in, t- in terms of your your life. Isn't that the case? Right. And no one paying rent. It's very tough. Let me ask you something. And I, I, I apologize for this question. I know it's a very difficult question. Do you anticipate things getting any better in the, in the future? And, and if so, can you give me some idea of when you feel things might get back on track a little better? <laughs> There's a reason I'm asking this. It's well, wait, wait a second, Zena. Before you answer that, I, I think we can make the assumption that Nelson's not asking you to give any <laughs> predictions on COVID. Uh, no, you know, what, I'm asking. Happen? Let me let me elaborate. I, I'm asking because I'm wondering if we might not be able to work out some arrangement where you pay less now and more at some point in the future, when perhaps, God willing, uh the situation that we're dealing with right now gets somewhat better. That's why I'm asking. In other words, what I'm saying to you is one option that I've seen in my many years of negotiating is that you put up an amount of money up front, and then there are periodic payments at some time in the future. And those payments could even be deferred to allow you to get back on your feet. That's why. Would something like that perhaps work for you at all? Uh, that's uh, an idea that I I could consider. But would they trust me to pay more later? They did. They wouldn't even trust me now. I mean, there would have to be an agreement which is stru- structured, and I'm only telling you the way that I've seen these agreements structured, in, in such a way that you would pay. In, in the future, and if you didn't pay the amount that you would uh, get, that you would have to pay for not paying would be more than what you agreed to pay. Let me be a little more clear about that. In other words, if you agreed to pay, say, $10,000 and you didn't pay ten, then the way these agreements are structured in my experience is that the amount would go back up to a higher amount if you didn't pay. However, they would have to give you notice that you missed the payment. Usually there's a 10-day notice provision. And if you don't make the payment within that 10 days, only then 
would you be subject to the higher amount? I'm sure your attorney could probably explain it better than I can because he's been through this yeah. a, a lot. But do you, do you get a sense of what I'm saying? In principle, I'm thinking that might work, but for the fact that there's so many gray areas that we're dealing with right now. I mean, yeah. the biggest one that Zena has to deal with right now, as you just mentioned before, is her rent. You know, the rent coming in from the tenants. It's just just because we have tenants, you know, in our building doesn't necessarily mean that they're paying. Maybe, and I'd give you a suggestion, maybe discuss with the other side, maybe instead of having Zena being personally liable, and so far as she was sued personally, instead maybe having her LLC be the signatory to the agreements, because if this way her LLC goes down, at least she has the liability shield from that standpoint, that may be something we could work with. Maybe. That's an idea. And uh, it's good that we're collaborating this way. Um, I can broach these issues without uh, saying anything about us having discussed them. And uh, with your, now let me ask you one question. Do I have your permission to make an offer of 4,000 or would you rather defer that until we discuss whether deferred or periodic payments would work. I think it makes more sense to defer, but I'll, Zena, you you make the call on this one. Yep. Great. Yeah, I think it, it makes much more sense to set up a structure first, and then afterwards we could discuss the details. You know, let's, let's what would you like me to tell them, if anything, about... Uh, and I would say this. In principle, we're willing to have some adjustment based on, on the initial offer. It's not going to be too much more. I wouldn't get into the details that we've expressed over here. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, you certainly can tell them that uh, in principle, the idea of a structured settlement, the staggered payments would be something we would we would consider if they're willing to consider it and actually trust uh, Ms. Orban. Okay. Very good. So let's end the caucus. On that positive note, that ends our session for the uh, for the private one scenario too. This is basically there's so much that went on there. Um, if you were now, what do we call this one? The, the matter of trust is is that that what we're on here? Yes. Yes. So matter you know, um, one fundamental problem. I, I know you. There's so much that you can't address everything. Uh, but just on this issue of a person coming there and saying, how do I know I, I can pay? I, I mean, how do I know they're gonna pay? They've, they've uh, you know, they've cheated, they've withheld the dollars. And now um, why should I expect you to get paid? I think I think there were, was a very helpful response when when uh, Nelson pointed out, well, you know, you're gonna get a you're gonna get an enforceable agreement. Um, other things that people sometimes do um, when there are, um, you know, when there is this uh, issue is sometimes they find, you know, well, let's have a confession of judgment. If there's going to be a payment over time or other mechanisms. And sometimes mediators will, you know, uh, you know, explore other ways for you to get protections for yourself if that's a concern. It doesn't even sound like an impasse to me because you were able, Nelson, to get the party to consider ways to deflect the issue of trust, um, ways to con to come up with something that satisfied their interest in terms of a deferred payment, and also because the payment might be higher or might be something that would be acceptable to deal with their interests as well, or satisfy an appeal to their into the uh, SBI's interests as well. And so I think there was really a lot of progress made in terms of attitude and in terms of approach to trying to resolve it. In the beginning with the, um, I think the hostility or the 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 sense of distrust from the, from the plaintiff, I think you showed a lot of, of good empathy by saying that you heard the pain in her voice and that that would lower the temperature in the room as well. I, I had a similar feeling, and and um, uh, uh, and it may what I'm about to say may be um, uh, undercut by the fact that Elon may have made a pedagogic choice not to be quite as aggressive this time as he was before. But I think part of the reason this was a calmer session and got further was because Nelson was speaking more to the party than to the lawyer. 
and really gave the party an opportunity to say what was on his mind. It was Elan who first mentioned that there were financial problems, but it gave Nelson the entree to have that conversation um, directly with the party. Um, and I think I think that helped to bring the temperature down a little bit. And everyone got the truth of the matter is uh, the, the truth came out um, that the, the reason that the uh, that the settlement proposal, the first settlement proposal was so low is or a reason the settlement proposal of $1,000 was so low is because they can't afford more. Um, so now what we're doing is uh, the mediators helping the parties think through ways that they could help to, that they could afford to pay a deal that makes sense for both sides, as opposed to coming up with money that the defendant just doesn't have. Also, um, that the that Alan was was willing to say they would show their financials to the plaintiff if they needed them, I think is also an indicator of trust and whether or not the plaintiff actually needs them. It shows that they are willing to take steps in order to show their good faith and their honesty in this. And I think that that's a big deal as well. And I would um, expect Nelson to be able to bring that up as a point of trust. Um, uh... I'd like to uh, talk about the uh, my role in the joint session because one of the questions was, uh, do you frame back or uh, my view in a joint session is to do nothing other than listen. I don't want to do anything in a joint session. Like if I were to reframe back, there's a risk that one of the parties may perceive that uh, I'm taking sides by the, uh, and of course we know mediators are impartial, but the perception of impartiality is uh, sometimes uh, as important or more important than the reality. So the safest thing to do in the joint session is just to listen. Uh, the only time I'll ask a question is if I didn't understand the point, could you explain what you mean by that or something like that? But I save all the reframing back, everything else for the caucus. Uh, and usually uh, that's when we got, I call it, we got to get past yesterday. And I think, I think Nim, uh, 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 Delson did a terrific job. I liked at one point when uh, it was a question of who should caucus first. He didn't pick anybody. He says, who wants to go first? You always uh, want to make sure that no one perceives anything you do as favoring one side or the other. So, uh, but I, I, I think it's, it's, it's. Um, that was a tip I got from Chuck Newman, by the way. Okay. I have to give him credit for that. No, that was from Steve. Oh, I listened I to it from Steve. <laughs> okay. But in any event, um, and uh, there's a lot more we could talk about. Um, I mean, many times I will also say I won't charge for my time. Uh, and I've done that, you know, to, to keep the parties there. Um, and in fact, one of the things I remember one case I had where we had a very complicated settlement agreement, non-competes, no disparagement. It was very complicated. And I figured, let's agree on everything other than the dollar number. We'll do that last. And when people invest a lot of time in the process, which they did in agreeing on the settlement agreement, they don't want it to fail. It, it, you have a momentum that builds up. And uh, ultimately, and this this happened to be a case that we mediated over, uh, it was over a year, it would span the, the negotiations. And um, it, 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 it really works when, when people have invested a lot of time in the process and uh, they don't want it to fail. So I just throw that out um, as, an example, there, there are many other things. We, we even had, you know, when you ask at the end of the 
at the end of the day, you know, uh, very often you have one yes and one no. You don't, you know, when you make a mediator's proposal, which always is a last resort. You never make a mediator's proposal. You do all the other impasse breaking techniques first, like the, will you go to X if they come down to Y? And then you ask the other side, will you come up to Y if they come down to X? And you try to narrow the gap, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, at the end of the day, um, you can get a second bite at the apple. Because I once asked, uh, would you give me permission? Uh, I, I asked the one who said uh, uh, no, or that said yes, would you give me permission to tell the other side uh, that you said yes? Um, and sometimes the emotional need of a plaintiff is to feel they squeeze the last nickel. And, and I asked, would you be willing to pay a little bit more uh, if we could get it done? Uh, and, and they said, yeah, if it's just a little. And he gave me, said, uh, uh, X dollars is, I, I would be willing to go to that. And uh, ultimately it worked because it met the emotional need uh, you know, that the plaintiff felt they squeezed the last nickel because every plaintiff thinks they're a victim and every defendant thinks they're being uh, extorted. So, um, Steve, when you say last nickel, can I take the last nine seconds? Sure. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. D just to point out structurally, if you think this is an impasse, it's, an, it's because of what's possible. The, the scenario where we now are, where, we, where one side has told the mediator only that they can't afford more. Um, that If that's an impasse, it's because of what is possible, not because of attitude. And, and I'm, I'm, this is not a place to talk about uh, the benefits of caucus and joint, but I, I invite you all to think about why that could not have been said or should not be repeated in a joint session so that everyone knows the same realities. Excellent point, Chuck. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to move right next into our seg uh, next segment. This segment, again, is a matter of trust, but now we are moving into a issue with respect to the mediator. You know, before we move to caucus, I have something to say. In the course of doing some internet research in preparation for today's session, I've come across some information that Ms. Zorba and I find to be of extreme concern to the integrity of the mediation process here, putting aside the fact that, as you all know, I'm not a fan of being here today in the first place. And here's what I found. Now, before I get into this, I'm just going to break roll for a second. I said a small prayer today that I do not overplay this uh, to Nelson's sen sensitivities. All right. This stuff is available on the web. It's been, you know, brought out. But nonetheless, I'm just saying that I am Nelson's friend. All right, in, in real life. Counsel. And and here as, I'm throwing as the something mediator, at you. All right. As the mediator, I would ask counsel to please bring this up with me in a caucus. Yes. And that's what and, I was, and no, but in this I case, will, but in this case, and the thing I did not, because I believe it's for everybody. So in going through some research on the new New York diversity, equity, and inclusion neutral directory. Uh, which is just put out by Robin Weinstein to the general DR community a couple of days ago. Uh, I did end up looking up Mr. Timken's profile in preparation for today's mediation session, and uh, he self-identifies as a person with a disability. Well, this was not closed, close, I'm back and roll now, this was not disclosed to Ms. Zorba and myself before, and I decided to do some further digging beyond that. As you can see, this is publicly available on the web. <laughs> right, uh, with the URLs, did some additional digging and found out that uh, Mr. Timken, back in 2019, had commented on a New York State Bar Association website uh, as to the website lawyersdepressionproject.org, a group of lawyers working to address this issue with online and in-person meetings at the New York City Bar. So, uh, Mr. Timken, you know, this does give me and Ms. Zorba cause for concern that uh, maybe you didn't uh, disclose this because uh, you know you feel embarrassed, and we certainly don't want to embarrass you. But uh, is there an issue here with some sort of disability that we need to know about? And uh, 
you know, we shouldn't be finding about this now. You should have been done, doing this earlier. Well, I apologize that you feel that way. Um, I'm very open when it comes to the fact that I am a, uh, a sufferer of depression and I belong to several groups. Uh, I didn't feel that it played any role in uh, my effectiveness as a mediator. And so I made the determination not to disclose that. It certainly uh, has no effect on uh, what I do here. But I will tell you that I have absolutely no uh, feeling of being ashamed that I do suffer from depression. Uh, however, here is my offer to you. If it is of concern to you and your client, there is a gentleman out there who is one of the leaders in the mediation area. Actually, there are several and one female. And I would offer to step aside and bring one of them in, either Mr. Baum, Mr. Hockman, Mr. Newman, or Ms. Camp. If that would make you feel more comfortable, because I certainly want you to be comfortable, you and your client, with whomever you have assisting you in reaching an agreement in this case. And I certainly hope that you do. Well, it's very heartfelt of you, Mr. Timken. Thank you for that. But at the end of the day, uh, just putting it out there, look, you know, I'm not no expert on this. But uh, depression does certainly impact your ability to process certain information, communicate things. Uh, is that right? No, no, it actually doesn't. All right. It, so it, are it has any... no bearing on that. I've been a fully functional person for the last 20 years. And it certainly doesn't upset me to have to address this. It's part of life. So, but I have and... to take your word for it. I mean, no. that's the thing. I, I have to take your, the word of a person who didn't you don't have to, though, before. because I'm offering to put someone else to have somebody else step in who, who and didn't, spell me. Yes, who didn't ultimately sign on to this in the first place. If you want to bring on a co mediator, what else? And, and what about the arrangement now with the court? What's that going to do with respect to the 90 minutes? Are you going to vouch for that person giving us the 90 minutes all to start all over again? So that you're going to have to pay for this type of thing? I mean, this is your fault. Suddenly, you want the whole 90 minutes? Yeah, I want, I want to start. If we have to bring people in. In fact, you want to know something? I want it told. We, we'll take where we are. For, you know what? No, actually, I take that back. I want an additional 90 minutes past the time necessary that I can get assurances and Ms. Zorba can get assurances um, in this case because, you know, we shouldn't be paying for this. This was information that was withheld from us. Granted, you know, I, I, I hear for you, Mr. Temkin, no, for sensitive anything. and what else. But- do you, do you have any objections to that, Chris? Do you, do you want yes. to? Wanna... Yes. Can I, can I speak, please, Mr. Timken? Sure. So, so the, the, the first thing is I, I don't think uh, that you have, have failed to make a disclosure here. Um, uh, Mr. Weiner was able to find this information out in publicly available sources. Um, that doesn't speak as, as to hiding anything or failure to disclose. Secondly, is as you say, I'm not aware of depression stopping people from functioning in their chosen professions. For all we know, uh, we have appeared before judges who have suffered from depression. Uh, we have flown on airplanes, flown by pilots suffering from depression. Um, it, it, it is it is a a sad um, uh, condition that, that affects a lot of people. Uh, and, and, you know, you have my and my clients, um, you know, sympathy and, and understanding. And if you tell us you can conduct this mediation uh, to the best of your abilities, then we, we will take you on your, your word for that. I would, I would also point out to Mr. Weinrib that the, the, the foundation of mediation is, is um, everything is done voluntarily and by consent. So you're, you, you having a, a medical condition isn't going to somehow force his client into making an agreement to settle this case that they wouldn't otherwise make. You know, I, I think this is a, 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 again, I think this is a, a tactic of Mr. Weinrib to, to, to try to run out the clock on the one hand 
Uh, and now that he wants another 90 minutes for free, drive up his fees on the other hand. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to, to proceed as we are. So I'll ignore all those personal attacks. And let me just take a step back and say as follows. We were not given the option to choose Mr. Timken in the first place. The court gave us a list of three neutrals, didn't mention anything about Mr. Timken potentially having this condition, and told us to pick. We went through based upon the information that was there. This information, by the way, uh, Chris, just to let you know, was only officially promulgated out uh, yesterday, so it was relatively late breaking. So Mr. Timken had already been previously selected. Uh, it's not a ploy by myself uh, at this time. It's a serious concern. And I just want to ask Mr. Temkin right out. I, I understand he suffers from the condition, so he certainly has personal experience, and I empathize with him. But uh, being a realist over here, I have to protect the interest of my client to make sure that she gets a process which is uh, of a sound nature. Is there any difference, Mr. Temkin, between a mediator who has depression and a mediator who doesn't have depression as they are engaged in the mediation process. Well, I I first first have to remind you that I'm not a decision maker. I'm not a judge. I'm not going to order you to do anything or order you not to do anything. But having said that, if there is any doubt in your mind, then uh, I respect that. And I will contact the ADR coordinator and ask her to step in and uh, select somebody else for you. That's fine. There's no harsh feeling on my part. Uh, and I understand your concern for your client. But do you believe here that you should have disclosed us? It's not requested. It's not part of what we're asked to disclose. It happens to be uh, something that is important to me uh, in terms of assisting other people uh, as a member of the Fordham uh, well, Well-Being Society. I, I try to assist other people who suffer from the similar issue. But as I said, uh, you have to do what's right for your client. And I certainly understand that. And I will gladly step aside and bring in the ADR coordinator to put someone else on the case. Well, I don't know if that's going to cut it, but you want to know something? This is really my client's decision. She's the one who ultimately has to pay you if 90 minutes goes out. So why don't we hear from her? Zena, why don't you, uh, Zorba, why don't you give us your opinion whether we could go forward or not? Because I still have my reservations. Well, it's tough to say, but if I was hearing correctly, he's not going to make a decision for us, right? So that's what he said. Right. Mediators can spin the facts, though. Keep that in mind. But uh, that's what he said. Well, now you're putting a doubt in my mind. Well, the whole idea behind presumptive mediation is ultimately to clear cases from the courts, which means to drive the parties towards settlement. And uh, that seems to be the case in the drive of the courts. They cut out their settlement rates. And if uh, you're moving up the ranks as a mediator, I just happen to know from speaking to my friends, the settlement percentage is a, is a big thing, you know, uh, so uh, this could certainly affect the ability uh, of uh, Mr. Temkin here to make certain decisions and uh, to be pushing us. Uh, do you still feel comfortable given the fact that he concealed this, uh, what I view to be a very important fact from us? Right, but that would be true for all mediators that would be put in front of us, right? I'd have to doubt everyone. Yeah, but the fact that he has unfortunately... Uh, this condition and the various stigmas which are associated with him, it gives him extra incentive because he knows that vis-a-vis -vis everybody else, if this comes out, he's going to have to be that much better, sort of to speak, in terms of percentages. So that gives him even more of an incentive to drive us towards a settlement that may not be in your best interest. Do you still feel okay. comfortable? That's my question. Right. I hear what you're telling me. Maybe, maybe you want maybe you want to suspend the mediation and then we'll we discuss it afterwards or do you maybe want to I think maybe just to move things along since we, we you, I'm sure you don't want to keep paying me for something like this and as, as things stand right now the best thing we could probably do to make lemonade out of lemons is to indeed bring in a, a co-mediator would you have any objection to bringing in but I don't want one uh, you know one could be Mr. Timkin's friend I, I want to bring in two in this process and to the extent there's any 
cost which is involved because Mr. Timken is the one who caused this. Let him pick up the bill for the uh, the co-mediators unless they're willing to volunteer, which I think they're probably fine one or two who would given his situation. But if they're not willing to volunteer, let him pick up the bill. But I want two. I want one selected by us and I want one selected by uh, by Chris with Mr. Timken's input, of course, since this is his issue. Would you, you think that would work? Yes. Sounds like a good idea. All right. Well, I'm not a huge fan of that, but since I do want to move at some point this process along, and I think by doing that, by having two independent co-mediators working with you, that would sort of restore the trust over here. Now the question is this, Chris, Ms. Collins, are you willing to do that? I think you're, you're needlessly overcomplicating things and overly stigmatizing depression, uh, but I will defer to my client. I agree with um, w- with my lawyer. Um, y- you're almost insulting the mediator by treating depression as a stigma. Um, and, I, and I think most lawyers and court personnel are depressed anyhow. Let's all exchange our antidepressants. This is this is not an issue. I think I think. It doesn't matter. If they want to have two mediators, three mediators, four mediators, fine, as long as this, the case gets gets solved. Okay, we'll agree. I have to say that I uh, don't agree to pay for the additional mediators um, because I don't feel that that's required. Um, well, you're the one who came up with the idea of bringing them on in the first place. At, and keep in mind, you're the one who caused the situation. Not, in, in, not bringing but them still on, concealed it. not bringing them on, replacing me with another mediator. No, well, I don't believe they, you should be replaced. I, they, I think, if anything, there should just be some checks and balances over here. I think that's the the best scenario. I, I agree that depression shouldn't be used, or any other mental illness for that matter, shouldn't be used as a stigma against someone. But on the other hand, if it's in the picture, it should be in the picture. We have to be able to make informed decisions, both as advocates and as neutrals in this process. And it's impossible to make an informed decision when one that's not fully informed. So the way to counteract a lack of information is with more information. And more yes, information sir. would be more perspective. I, I don't agree that someone with a disability needs to disclose that as a condition of being employed. Well, whose process is this? Is it yours or is it, is it ours? It's your process. However. It's our process. Then, then there are certain I, I, I view the process as being ours and it's constructing. It. So if that's the case, this is our process. Uh, don't, infr- don't infringe on, upon our autonomy to define the process as we want. Our view of the process is that but it don't requires ask me to, that you don't be ask checked. me to pay for it either. Well, it, Mr. Weiner, could you point to a, uh, a rule under which this mediation is occurring uh, that would allow you to partake of the course of action you want yeah, to? Yeah, so it would be Rule 8, we're dealing with, respectively with conflicts of interest. There's an appearance of impropriety here by a failure to disclose a condition which is as severe as this. Granted, this is, Mr. Timken says what he says, and I'm sure I could read the literature about this, but given that this is a curveball thrown at the last minute, uh, I'm not un- entirely sure about that. The way to get insurance is over here is to solve that, but I think it falls within the rubric of, of Nassau rule, court, uh, rule 8 with respect to conflicts of interest, and that there is... Uh, an appearance of impropriety here by the failure to disclose. Now, whether or not that actually holds up in, under current mediation ethics and the way people have interpreted things and maybe people who are experts in the ADA and other disability statutes, I may be dead wrong. I don't know. But one way or another, mediation takes place in the shadow of the law. It is not the law itself. And in that aspect, my client wants a process which gives her enough assurances. Right now, we've had a breach in the integrity of the process. The way to cure the breach is for Mr. Timken to make it right. My suggestion okay. is to contact the ADR coordinator and to seek his or her advice. Oh, for God's sakes, so you know what's going to happen. The ADR coordinator is going to turn around and say, okay, so there was an issue over here. I can't disclose this to the court because of other considerations. It's going to go unnoticed. Hopefully, Mr. Timken, you never do it again, all right, that you conceal something like this. But then what ends up happening is that she's going to start turn around and replace it. We're going to have to start over from square one. We're going to get another order of reference. I'll have wasted my time. Chris will have wasted his time. Mr. Timken, you will have wasted my time. I'm giving you a way out over here, but I'm also at the same time asking you to make it right. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to pay for other uh, mediators. So find volunteers. And uh, Find volunteers. What I'm going to do is I'm going to suspend the mediation at this point. And I'm going to notify the ADR coordinator that there's an issue. 
and she will reach out to you and to find out what the issue is and what they would like to do about it. Well, regardless of whatever you're going to do, Mr. Timken, I view this as being unprofessional conduct as defined under the NASA County rules. And as a result, when you reach out to the ADR coordinator, I will let her know that this came up and whatever happens, happens after that. I'm not certainly here, Mr. Timken, to make your life difficult. What I'm here to do is to make sure that my client gets a process which is satisfactory to her and which she can trust. Right now, based upon the fact that we had this information disclosed by my finding this out, by my digging, all right, we end up having a breach in the trust of the overall process. And that, as a mediator, is something that just shouldn't be happening. Now, if the remedy, if the remedy is, is, is too much for you over here, you know, I, I'll be willing to do this. I'll be willing to reach out and to find a mediator who will do this on a pro bono basis. Chris, would you be willing to do the same to get a, a mediator who do it on a pro bono basis? And I will not, would, wouldn't make Mr. Timken pay because maybe, you know, that's, that's being a little bit too aggressive. But do you agree, Chris, that if we could find someone who would be on, on both of our sides, who would do this on a pro bono basis, we bring on two co-mediators and hopefully we end this thing? Well, are you going to go do some internet sleuthing on them? Are you going to ask them if they? No, if, 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 I'm, if I'm going to be vetting them, they're going to be my medi- my mediator, just like you should do the same with your mediator. I think it's, gonna... it's, everybody should do due diligence to whatever mediators they pick, whether it's you know asking someone who's mediated with them before, or just doing some simple internet research. Yeah. Can I ask one question, else. counsel, if I may? Why did you wait until so long to do this vetting and bring it? to my attention? Ah, that is a great question. As I said before, the information regarding the neutral directory only was published yesterday, or actually two days ago, I'm sorry. It was published on Tuesday, January 4th, uh, when Robin Weinstein sent out this email to my mediator friend. And I just happened to see that you were on it at the time. So I wasn't necessarily going looking for it, you know, hook, line, and sinker, but the fact is that it appeared and, you know, I red flagged me at that time. So uh, but the delay does not did not give me any chance to ameliorate the situation, counsel. Well, the this failure to disclose shouldn't have taken place in the first place. Whether the delay occurred or not, maybe I should have been a little bit more proactive. That's me a cop on that regard. But guess what? At the end of the day, still was yours to disclose. All right, we end off this session over here. We now turn it over to our panelists. Nelson, thank you very much. I, I want to jump in for a second. I, I have lots of things to talk about uh, about um, the substance of what we just saw, but I want to focus uh, on some on a very <coughs> small thing that Alan said that many lawyers think is true and it's not. And I want to clarify this. Uh, Alan said, uh, as part of this uh, attack on the mediator, Alan said the point of presumptive ADR is to move cases faster through the courts. That is an argument that failed by itself for years to get the courts to adopt presumptive mediation. What got the courts finally to adopt presumptive mediation is when the leading judges actually participated in some trainings about mediation and learned how important party agency is to to resolutions and how mediated resolutions are far more enduring than litigated or lawyer negotiated uh, uh, resolutions. And a big reason that we have presumptive ADR is to give the opportunities for the parties to have a better process within the court structure than they were getting without mediation. So it is when, if you hear lawyers saying, Um, This whole thing is a docket busting exercise. You can tell them that is not true. Docket busting was not a good enough reason. It was because the courts are trying to give a better, holistic, client-centered process to resolve their disputes as early as possible without the need of a lot of litigation. I have lots of other comments about what we just saw, but I'll defer to others. I wanted to make that point about why we have presumptive ADR. I think, you know, quality is what you're talking about. Party agency is what you're talking about. I just have to make one editorial comment. I feel like I'm in a horror show. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) That was, oh, my God. (laughs) I just can't imagine a lawyer doing doing what uh, 
Alan just did, but you never know. I, I get the feeling that Alan is like a, a trauma victim from a ton of mediations where he suffered abuse at the hands uh, of attorneys. So most of the rules, fortunately, you know, I had a chance to get involved with drafting the commercial division ethics rules back in the 90s. Most of the rules in the courts, when it comes to mediation ethics uh, in particular, find their source in another set of rules, uh, which is the model standards of conduct for mediators, AAA, previously Spider, then ACR, uh, and, uh, and the ABA um, put together. And when we're thinking about some of these, the ethical issues that was raised here, um, really, uh, there's just a few a handful uh, of core standards that we look at for mediator um, for, for mediator ethics. Self-determination, what Chuck said. Uh, this is the party-driven process. The party's choice is what matters. Impartiality. Of course, we want the new to, neutral to be impartial. And Nelson was saying he, he was impartial. Conflicts of interest. We, you know, it's hard to see any conflict of interest here. The issues here, and from an ethics standpoint, that were raised from a mediation ethics standpoint, not an attorney ethics standpoint, is competence. Uh, is there anything here that makes uh, Nelson incompetent? And you, we heard what Nelson said about that. He can, he can, can he can be a, a you know, uh, th that issue is is uh, is not being raised in a meaningful way here at all. And the second. You know, beyond confidentiality, the, se the second really significant one is quality of the process. So a mediator has to conduct a mediation in a way that promotes diligence, timeliness, safety, presence of the right parties, party participation, uh, procedural fairness, party competency, and mutual respect. Um, it should only mediate if prepared, uh, only if they can satisfy reasonable expectations of parties, um, you know, uh, they talk about presence, should be honest, and, uh, promote honesty and candor uh, between and among the participants, uh, not, not uh, promote uh, material misrepresentations of fact, uh, watch out for uh, mixed roles, you know, mediator plus something else. Um, you can go through these, but it's hard to find in the mediator standards of conduct anything that would suggest that anything Nelson had done from a mediator standpoint was in any way unethical or something that needed to be uh, shared. I don't know if people disagree with that, but I, I'm curious. Uh, and and Nelson's, uh, Nelson's valiant effort to, uh, to say, hey, try somebody else, open question on the preparation and everything else for that. But he was putting it back to party empowerment until they pushed a little far. And then when they did, he said, look, let, let me back away. Let, let the administrator deal with it. I, I wonder how everybody else on the panel felt about, uh, about that interaction, both from the standpoint of the mediator who was uh, you know, on the ropes and in an unexpected position, as well as uh, in terms of the issue. I would have been mortified if that were me. I think it was humiliating and designed to be humiliating. It focused on something that could be very insignificant and it's being treated to something that's very debilitating. Um, it sounded like an excuse to torment the mediator and end it. Um, but in any event, it raises so many questions now um, in the perhaps in the minds of the parties that I would probably have just withdrawn and let them deal with the ADR coordinator because I would have felt highly uncomfortable. And that level of being uncomfortable, I think, would have impacted the mediation, not the depression. Um, but I, it was a horrifying, I agree with you, Simeon and Chuck, a horrifying thing to, to watch. It, re it really was. You know, when, well, I, I didn't even get a chance. I, do any of the other commentators want to go before I do? Because I, I, um, uh, to talk about what we just what we just saw, not not that one little issue about what presumptive ADR is designed to do um, uh, for for people without a, a lot of experience in this, you, you're not going to see this. This, is, again, was a pedagogic uh, technique. You're not going to see anything like this um, from the from the uh, impasse to, to look at it from the impasse point of view. It turns out that one of the things that Alan thought he was doing, which was a lance, turned out to be a great shield for Nelson to use because Elon asked the question, um, do you think, Mr. Timken, 
that the quality of a mediation is different for a mediator with depression and a mediator without depression. Nelson's answer could have been, no, I don't. I understand that you do. I don't think it makes any difference. And it is not a material fact that I ever withheld from you. I also didn't tell you my shoe size or the fact that I prefer chunky to creamy peanut butter. None of that has anything to do with my ability to help you help your clients find a way to put this dispute behind them. I have no power to make any decisions. There is nothing about my medical treatment, hangnail, depression, or cancer that has anything to do with my ability to help you today. If you feel otherwise, please say so, and I will withdraw. Everyone in the mediation room needs to be comfortable being there, and that includes the mediator. I'm not going to listen to this anymore. Interestingly, you know, if we're looking at an impasse program and how you get past it, th this was uh, one thought, let's create an impasse by, by killing the mediator. <laughs> uh, it's kind of an interesting uh, concept. Would the mediator, Nelson, would you have felt differently in a way that might have biased you against Alon and his client because of what he just put you through? Not really, because in the 33 years I'm in practice, 28 in the court system, I've had desperate people resort to desperate tactics to attempt to uh, avoid the inevitable, if you understand what I'm saying. And some of the tactics have been extremely um, desperate and extremely, uh, how can I say this, conscience, conscienceless if that's a word, <laughs> uh, to the extent that um, there is no boundary. Unconscionable. Um, unconscionable to the extent that there's no boundary. So, no, I'm here to do the right thing. And that's what I'm here to do. That's before good. we I close, we before, great job, Nelson. Before we close, we Tom. Sorry. Oh, go ahead, Delina. I was just going to say, I think we'd have to ask ourselves that question, whether being attacked and um, and questioned like that for something um, of that nature, a disability is is will affect the way you view the parties. And that and that's just something that you have to ask much the same way if, if you were um, a, a Biden supporter and someone came in with a MAGA hat, if that would affect how you view them in the mediation. It's not exactly uh, the same situation, but it brings up the question of let me say, let and, me just, and external biases. I'm sorry to interrupt, but let me just say this, Alita. I have in the materials a little synopsis from the getting to yes, from one of the chapters in getting to yes. And one of the things that it says is not to be drawn into the negativity. That's what you don't want to have happen as a mediator. And so that's what I'm trying to do, not to be drawn into the negativity. I'm sorry to have interrupted you. No, no, no. I think you're, and I think you're doing an admirable job of that. And, and I would agree with you. Closing okay. comment before we close this, I, I, I'd like to say is, is Nelson said this was an act of desperation by uh, Alon. The question I would have is desperate for what reason? You got people here trying to potentially make a deal. I mean, we've had wonderful, you know, and exciting and entertaining uh, displays of all kinds of uh, extreme behavior by counsel. One of the benefits we have in real mediation, in real life, is that we can penetrate. Uh, we can penetrate and talk with people for real. And they can see that the mediator, that we're, we're decent people. And that actually everyone around the tables, basically decent, intelligent, capable people of fundamentally even goodwill, despite what people might see, despite the trust deficit. And we have an opportunity, the opportunity to, to work together and get something resolved. And when we ring that bell with that message, it cuts through, you know, all this kind of gamesmanship 
because what's the game? You, you, you play a game to win some advantage. But what's the advantage of killing your opportunity to get the, the good stuff, the, the stuff that lawyers and clients are really looking for? And, and Simeon, um, from, from a rational perspective, I agree with you 100 percent. The problem and, is and I'm that, speaking from beyond a rational perspective, from a human, emotional, blended, ratio, emotional perspective. People see the reality and they see the opportunity. And what we can do as mediators is, is communicate it in a, in a decent and, and credible way. And, 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 and by the way, you know, uh, Nelson's been uh, a model of uh, the phlegmatic, right? I think that's the right word, you know, staying impassive in, in the face of all kinds of things. The, these are obviously, as, as uh, both Chuck and Simon have pointed out, extreme cases. <clears throat> but I have to say that in some of the other cases where I've been faced a number of times with, uh, I'm here, I don't want to mediate, and uh, uh, I'm going to do my 90 minutes. My approach there has been, let's do and try to use the time productively, and we'll see before we reach the end of the 90 minutes if, it's, if, it's, if we have accomplished anything and see whether it's worth continuing by leaving the door open and never uh, taking a no for an answer. Uh, that, that has been quite helpful. Um, but otherwise, I have to say that this is a fantastically good program. And I think I congratulate everyone, uh, Elon, uh, Chris, uh, Nelson, for putting such a good show. Thank you very much for all of that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you for your participation. And you missed your calling. You should have been an actor, Elon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anybody who knows Seth Rubenstein, the uh, famous trust in the state's lawyer, he once told me the same thing. But Simeon, I don't want to anyway. take away from what we're saying. Just one thing, you know, here you've got, you know, people being embattled. Elitists raised the question of, you know, whether it's implicit bias or impact and, you know, the ability to continue in neutrality. Uh, you know, I, I candidly share with Nelson this belief in, in you know, uh, kind of a Gumby-like flexibility and the, you know, the ability to roll with it no matter what people do or say. But we have to be sensitive to these things. Years ago, uh, the, the um, ABA had what they call the masterclass for mediators that was held, I think, in Philly or Boston. I think it was in Philly. Um, and we put together, you know, several seminars and there was a plenary session, one or more um, and there was a mediator in a plenary session, and now I'm blocking the guy's name, um, who's an amazing guy. And he got up and he told a story uh, about how he mediated a personal injury matter. And it was a horrible set of injuries. And he broke down, Bob Creel, Bob Creel, and he, he broke, broke down and cried during the mediation. And he put this out to a group of very, you know, experienced mediators. And like, what, hey, what do you think of that? That's what I did as a mediator. I cried. Um, and I actually think that, that was good. And the same guy talked about putting his hand on, on the back of people. The human touch. While we're going through all the things we go through as mediators, a, a kind of amazing question. Is it art? Is it science? Or is it just reality? Um, how is it we can be genuine? How is it we can respond with real authenticity uh, as mediators uh, to what's happening? And at the same time, recognize our role is not to direct, is to facilitate, uh, is to help be with them, be in you know, a support how can we be genuine, but also how can we be neutral, but also be authentic? Um, and sometimes our tones might change, and sometimes our you know you know things can impact us, and maybe we can share the impact and still hang in uh, in our, our role fundamentally as neutrals because we're also human beings. So this is a big issue that you know Bob uh, kicked off. 15 years ago, uh, it, you know, it's one of these things that's more current now, perhaps, to think about in terms of implicit bias and how we're, we're approaching that. So I think bringing this up in this context where people have been shaken in any number of ways, something to think about. 
Well, so you can be neutral and still show empathy towards the parties and and to help identify with them and establish rapport and trust and yet be neutral. And part of it is how you are and part of it is how the, the parties see you as well, I think. Very true. Thank you so much for everybody's comments. Before we get into the next uh, scenario, uh, I just want to say again, uh, thank God, I think my prayer was answered because Nelson wasn't uh, shaken by that too much. And I'm sure he's going to be my friend still after this is over. But if I put in the chat, I never in a million years would ever make any statements like that. I am very much playing outside my role, just like Robin Williams did in one hour photo, if anybody ever saw that movie, which was uh, a good movie. But at the same time, uh, it definitely was not the typical Robin Williams uh, character. Uh, all right. Uh, just a very quick answer to the question that was uh, before we get into our, our next session. Susanna Mancini said, Nelson, did you know about this ambush? The answer is absolutely not. As I said before, this was unscripted to try to give a representation of what you have in real life. Uh, the only person who knew about this uh, because she was my client was Federica slash Zina Zorba. And now we're going to get into our last um, scenario for the evening, which is going to be entitled, Let Me Die with the Philistines. And again, as I uh, put this in the uh, materials, I've seen this occur occasionally in the private mediation context as well, but um, I've seen it more happen in the court annex context. Uh, this, this scenario, just very quickly, just to recap, this scenario we, we dealt with previously, the idea of hard negotiation. That was the theme of scenario one. We dealt with the idea of trust on two levels, trust of the parties, trust of the mediator, and now we're going to be dealing with the realm of fear. All right, uh, that is the general backdrop of this scenario. And with that, we're going to pick up from page 10 on the materials. What I was gonna say is that I am going down, but everyone is going to die with me. I want everyone here to know that I have not received any rent since 2020 and um, don't think that I am trying to negotiate or trying to play a role or um, in some type of a tactic. I firmly believe that SPI is not entitled to one cent here. And um, liar. <laughs> I thought I heard something, but I was supposed to be <laughs> speaking. <laughs> anyway, I. Um, if I end up losing in court, which I don't think it's going to happen, I will do everything that is in my power, including, but not limited to declaring bankruptcy. And uh, I will even represent myself. But uh, what I wanna do is make sure that SPI will not get any money. Um, I told you. So even if this means my financial death, I don't care. I'm going and down and you're coming down with me. And just to make a representation as counsel, we're back to the $1,000 uh, as nuisance value as was stated in the pre-mediation statement. We've retracted back to that position. I told you they're not honest. They're not. We see it now. Mr. Temkin, you care to respond to that? You're on mute. I know that you find this upsetting. But it's just declared a war against my finances and my reputation. Of course, I'm upset. Please let her finish the statement so that I can. You're biased. Uh, get involved. Okay. Well, it's actually finished. I am not thinking about paying anything. They don't deserve it. And uh, I don't think it's worth their time to, to pursue me. I understand that. This situation is painful for both of you. And uh, I understand that each of you feels that you're right. But as I've said before, we need to get together rather than each of us staying in our own separate silos. We need to try to fashion a resolution to this situation. And I would like to very much help you do that. Uh, what I suggest now is I would like to speak to Ms. Zorba and her attorney uh, in a uh, in a caucus, if if that would be possible. 
Ms. Zorba? Yes. We have discussed before in another scenario uh, the financial impact that this has had on you. And as I told you, I'm, I'm very sympathetic. Uh, but I, I think um, you have to think about what is available to you as a remedy and what may not be available. You run a business involving real estate, correct? Yes. Uh, have you considered the effect that a bankruptcy might have upon your business? Of course. I'm a business uh, owner. What if you wanted to refinance your property? What would the bank see in terms of a bankruptcy? Well, I'm pretty much there anyway. Well, you're you're never there until you're there. And uh, it, in my experience, will have an extremely negative impact on your ability to refinance the property, should you wish to do so, should you wish to someday expand. Do you know how many years a bankruptcy stays on your record? Ten years. That's a very long time. You certainly don't want to have that on your record. For 10 but years. I certainly don't want to pay them either. Well, we can come up with some options. We they can pay come me? up with options by which you can pay less and make some payments in the future. And they don't get, deserve a cent. Well, uh, that's your opinion. But that may not be the opinion of a jury who's hearing this case. Mr. Tenkin, before you terrorize my client any further, let me just point I'm out to you. I'm not terrorizing her. Well, I think you are. He, he, here's, telling here's, her that there are other options. Other yeah, than other options, which include winning. basically capitulating. Keep, keep in mind, Mr. Tenkin, I think you're missing something over here, which is that just the reality of the situation is there's no money coming in right now. All right? Right. We're, looking, we're looking at a bottomless pit, a bottomless pit of despair. All right, whether it's caused by COVID or whether it's caused by recalcitrant tenants, you talk about paying over time. All right. Well, yeah, if we had 500 years, we all have extraordinarily lengthy lifespans because somehow the virus mutates and makes us live for that long. Great. You know, maybe that would that would be wonderful. But in the realm of reality, as opposed to where I think you're coming from, we have to come up with something. That you talk but about you options. don't believe that that's going to last forever. Otherwise, no, how would but, you but, get but, paid? But what's the story now? How do we deal with this now, Mr. Temkin? I'm not hearing it. If you, you want to come up with options, they're not coming up with options. Their options are thirty five thousand dollars. Uh, I'll just let tell you, me, Ms. Zorba doesn't have. Ms. Zorba let doesn't me have speak to them stuff. about. Let me speak to them about what other possibilities are out there. You're you're putting the cart before the horse, Mr. Weinrib. Well, Let's talk and see what we can do before heard, we give up the game. You, know, you heard Ms. Collins before. She views this as we just declared war on her. Why would they even bother going to do that? And in fact, this is that we really don't because have much of they're upset. And when people are upset, they say things out of pain and anguish. And that doesn't mean that that's how they really feel. It's just them expressing their upsetment. Well, I want to hear them. We've been in caucus going back and forth the entire time. And you know, to a certain extent with, with the process, I understand there's certain things that you want, want to come out in a confidential manner in caucus. I want to hear it from them in a, in a joint session. I want to really I'm hear willing to go back and forth as long as it takes, and I'll give you half price on my rate. How about that? No, it's not the issue so much about the not money. The money. The money. It's, it's not the, the money. It's not the getting the people together. Yes, it, it's getting people together. Let's get out of caucus. Bring everybody back, and let's hear what they have to say to our faces, as opposed to going back and forth. No problem. Let's end this caucus then. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Fladgate and uh, Ms. Collins, uh, I just want to ask you, and, and the the defendants would like you to talk about this in front of them. And as long as it remains civil, I don't think we have any problem. Uh, is there any way? 
that something can be worked out in light of the fact that, as you know, she doesn't have rents coming in at the present time, and COVID has put a cramp on her business. If you can't answer that question right away, maybe you and your attorney can talk about it and see if uh, you can take that into some consideration. Would that be possible? She's, everybody's suffering financially these days. She's not the only one. Why can't she take into account my case? You know, I had not only uh, materials I had to buy, but labor. Think a little bit about other people. You're, you're such a biased mediator. It's, it's incredible. We need to think about, we need to think about each other. Otherwise, we're not going to come to any resolution. In your view, we need how to think, how to think about each other in an egocentric way. Charlene, yeah. do, do, do you want me? I'll, uh, yeah, please. You're I'll, my attorney. I'll, I'm paying you talk. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll talk about what we discussed uh, while uh, they were caucusing. So um, my, my client feels that there's been more caucuses uh, with, with Zorba and her counsel by you today and that, that that's leading to uh, some appearance of, of some bias, that you want to spend more time uh, talking to them, listening to them, getting their point of view. Uh, and then pushing it on to us. Now, um, I've counseled my client to say that's not necessarily true, that, that each mediation is different. Uh, but, you know, feelings are what feelings are. In, in on relation- the other hand, counsel, it, it could just be that uh, one side has given me the impression of being more willing to want to resolve this issue than the other. <laughs> and one side may need to have a little bit uh, more gentle nudging. Excuse me, to- but somebody who dedicates themselves to a war against my financial well-being is not somebody who's willing to play. She's a liar. I tell you, I can't trust anything. Ms. Collins, We are here just please. because of your mistakes. Ms. Collins, who, please. Who brought the mediation? This Ms. Charlene, do you want me to the other thing we talked about? Folks, 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 is this getting us anywhere? So how is this working for, for each of you? Is this working? It's not. That's why court annex mediation shouldn't be had. It's well, forced upon us. It's what we have, sir. And well, so do something that, about it. The best, it's the best that we've got. All right, look, Chris, and, let's, let's, let's talk turkey for a second. Why are we here? Do you want me to answer why, why, why did your why did you bring why did you bring this case so far in advance? You know, you, 2018. You could have done let it me ask pandemic. this: Would the two attorneys like to caucus together? No, I want my client to hear this. Would you like to caucus without me? If you no. feel that I'm somehow biased, perhaps that would work for you. I'm I think the whole claim of bias is just a pretext, again, to gain an advantage in this entire proceeding. I want some information mm-hmm. over here about how, if COVID is affecting everybody, how is it, Chris how, and, and, and Ms. Collins, how is it affecting, how is it affecting SPI? How okay. is it affecting SPI? Why, what, 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 what does SPI know of this whole thing? Is SPI a landlord? Is SPI uh, in the same okay. situation? Mr. Have Weinrib, you worried about that? They, they have your question. Please they, they, give them a chance to respond. All right, go, go ahead, ahead. Mr. Thank, thank you for your question. Turning to relevant matters, the question here really is does Zorba, does she want to own her building? Because if she wants to own her building, (laughs) she will come up with a settlement. If she doesn't want to continue owning her building, then we, and we won't, we we don't need to be as inflamed emotionally uh, as, as Ms. Zorba was in her statement before, we will just march forward with this case. When we win, if we cannot be paid, we will force the building to be sold and we will happily stand in line with all other creditors of Ms. Zorba. So if she is true in what she says, then the calculus to us is this. If she is getting no rents but she wants to own the building, make us an offer. We are are happy to have structured payments over a period of time while she's still owning the building and the pandemic has ended, and rent moratoriums have been lifted, and she is collecting rent from the building. And we will take that money uh, based on a settlement. But if if she's saying, I've got no money now, so you either take a pittance now or nothing, 
then we'll just move forward with the case. It's really that simple. It's not that difficult. Uh, you're Mr. Right, you're Mr. Weinrib and no, Ms. Zorba, would that work anything. for you, making a payment now and then periodic payments in the future? No, because again, you know, as we'll just put it out here right now, it, with the way COVID is going, making periodic payments, we could do a payment now, certainly, with some, some minimal amount. But going forward for the future, what are we doing about uh, the situation with COVID? It's just too much uncertainty. But we can factor that into the amounts of the payments. We're flexible. We can use ingenuity. That's well, why God gave us intelligence. We can use our intelligence and come up with some ingenious uh, serve everybody's needs. Well, you know, it's as it is right now, it's late in the day. I'll crunch some numbers with Ms. Zorba. I think we'll suspend for right now. And we'll agree to reconvene in two weeks and maybe we could come up with something. I don't think that we're going to get anywhere, but uh, look, in principle. One never knows unless work. one tries. Please, sir. One never knows unless one tries. And I would ask, let us suspend for today. We'll, we'll, you guys can discuss it. You can discuss it amongst yourselves or you can reach out to one another. I've seen cases settle that way. And then you can contact me and I would love to meet with everybody again to see if we can come to the compromise that serves everybody's needs. How Still is not that? a fan of this process, but I do appreciate your time and effort, Mr. Timken. Thank you very much. No we'll problem. see you back in two weeks. To the extent what this was presenting uh, as let me die with the Philistines was basically someone coming up, up and saying, you might be right. You might win the case, but I don't have the resources to pay. I, I, I don't know about everybody else on this panel, but I'm guessing everyone here has had that uh, happen plenty of times, you know, in mediations and, and in, uh, in legal practice. Um, and, you know, you're left with uh, then having to deal with the financial reality, just as we would, and as was raised by uh, uh, by Chris, I think, and 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 also uh, by uh, by Nelson. You know, have, we have to deal with bankruptcy uh, considerations. It's very similar to a bankruptcy. Uh, I think the one one thing that happens when people uh, raise financial ability is, you know, and as a mediator, in advance of the mediation. If we get a sense that, that that's one of the factors that, that's going to be raised and it's going to change uh, the, 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 the matter of the negotiation, um, I, I will tend to say, maybe in a confidential discussion, listen, if you're going to raise this, you ought to be prepared to show it. Um, have, have the financial documentation around just the way you would if you were uh, a, you know, a, a debtor. Uh, after a judgment or somebody in bankruptcy to be able to demonstrate, the, you know, what the resources are, you know, whether it's P&L, tax records, you know, uh, asset picture, affidavit, whatever it is to have that in the background uh, available. Not saying that they have to do it, but to, to prepare people so that, because that's the typical pushback um, is, you know, people talking COVID now, everybody gets it. But, but the typical pushback is, well, we don't believe them. We, we, you know, matter of trust, we don't believe. So, so if lawyers come in prepared with that from the financially challenged party, the media helps them uh, be prepared for that. That's helpful. Uh, but what we saw here as an impasse breaker was was basically all the things you would normally do uh, if there were the the scenario, which is just well, let's explore it and let's see what's feasible and think about payment over time and test and see if that's reality. Because once people process it. Uh, reality is reality. Nobody needs to waste time and money uh, chasing an empty bag. I wouldn't let fall into the trap where you had a joint session and because I don't I don't believe we in, in doing anything in a joint session uh, where you're running the risk of as happened here, being perceived as being on one side or the other. Uh, so 
I would much prefer to say, look, uh, I'm happy to, to talk to you in, in, in caucus, but um, you don't want to, in a joint session, start negotiating uh, because of the fact that you're going to be perceived, which is exactly what happened here, as being on the other person's side. So, uh, and I had, I once made a very bad mistake, which I want to share with you. I was once talking with the lawyers and the client wasn't there. And I was pointing out all the reasons why their client had a terrible case. And so they decided they, to fire me as the mediator uh, because I was, the client wasn't there. And, and, and it's the client who has the stake in the outcome. So it's very dangerous to um, to um, with lawyers only to to uh, basically show how weak their case is because you just may be uh, 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 talking yourself out of out of being the, the mediator. Steve, what should I have done? Uh, I I would have basically said. Let's not, uh, uh, I don't think it's constructive that we do this in, in a joint session. Uh, I'm happy to talk with each one of you separately in caucus because the, 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 what's likely to happen is what happened here. Where they accused you of, of taking sides. And the, the last thing you want to, do is be perceived as taking sides. So you you just don't 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 give them the, and 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 I have remember saying to uh, uh, on several occasions, don't give this person that you're so angry at the power to cause you to act against your own self interest. Uh, do what's best for you. Don't focus on them. Oh, uh, I should have kept it in caucus? Yes. If, okay. I dissent from that, but let's let other people talk first. I ju I well, just actually, Chuck, since you said you dissent, what would you have done in joint session? Well, uh, it, it, pretty much whatever happened here. Uh, my, my, my view about this is just think about this as you as you mediate, as you mediate as an advocate or as you mediate as the neutral. Um, there are there are lots of things that happen in caucus. Oh, gosh. Um, uh, Alan, can we take a minute to to diverge from impasse and talk about caucus versus yeah, joint? It's, it's part, it's part right. of the let, let me story. let me make my let me make my impasse points first. And, and I should d uh, disclose, full disclosure here, <laughs> um, I'm the last person to see impasse. Um, I, I think of impasse as, oh, you haven't agreed yet. Let's keep going. I don't know where the line between impasse and disagreement is. Um, and as a consequence, I just keep going. And that's a perfect segue into what I think Nelson did right in this scenario, which was to keep them talking. And you saw what happened by having them keep talking. Chris came up with an idea. Elon instructed um, Nelson, the lawyer instructed the mediator, you have to come up with some good ideas to tell them. But what happened was Nelson kept Chris and, and his client talking and they came up with some ideas. The genius of the mediator, oh God, Simeon and Steve have heard me say this a thousand times. The genius of the mediator is to bring out the genius of the parties and the lawyers, not to come up with the answers, but to facilitate 
the parties and lawyers coming up with the answers. And, and the takeaway from this, the impasse takeaway from this scenario was persistence and perseverance. Patience, persistence, perseverance. I don't know. Maybe we could come up with some more Ps. Um, but I, I, I thought that was a great job, and it had exactly the right effect. Chris started coming up with some ideas. I have a comment, it, it, and, and this may be an impasse comment. And if you want, either during this segment or in the after party, if people want to hang around, we could talk about the difference between caucus and joint session. But on the challenge that I think you're biased, you, you're taking the other side's side. And what I'm about to say here, some of you will recognize is coming straight out of Himmelstein and Friedman and the understanding-based model of mediation. Um, the truth of the matter is, I am on the other person's side. I heard the other person at the beginning of this session say that their goal in being here was to try to get to an agreement with you. I want him to succeed in that. I'm on his side in helping him come to an agreement with you. I am also on your side because I heard you say the same thing. You're hoping to get to an agreement. Now, it turns out the way Elon played this, that's not what they said at the beginning of this. But almost always, they will say in the opening something about, we're here to see if we can find a deal that's better for everybody. Once they have said that, you're perfectly allowed to keep them engaged by reminding them that the goal of the process is to come to an agreement with the other side. I want you to succeed. I'm on your side. And I'm on the other guy's side, too, because you want the same thing. Um, so uh, if there's an a impasse takeaway on that, it's to sort of diffuse the challenge that I think you're biased. I think that's a that's a great um, approach. I'm going to use that. Thank you very much. Todd. It's all yours. I, I give you Himmelstein and Friedman's approach. Thank you. <laughs> but also, I think just very specifically, when um, when when uh, the plaintiff's lawyer said the lifting of the rent moratorium, something about the rent moratorium, that's a great thing to hang your hat on because it is it is definite, it's neutral, it's a way of um, of approaching it as a as a as a parameter for when payments might be due, and it really gives you something to focus on, which is which is it's almost a creative kind of solution, or at least it's something that gives you a firm way of, of looking at it. So it's not, this is certainly not expansive. It's not even in the same category of the things that Simeon and Chuck were saying, but it's a way of starting to work with the parties and really make headway. If they could agree that the rent moratorium is, is, um, is a parameter, is a line, then it allows you to start to work with the, within that framework of coming to a resolution. So just to let everybody know, thank you so much, Alita, and thank you, Simeon, Steve, Chuck, and also Pierre. He's not here anymore. He's on his way to Amagansett, but if, if he's still uh, listening, I don't know if he is on the background on the attendee side. Thank you also to Pierre. Thank you all so much. Just to let everybody know where we are in the program right now. We've switched our backgrounds back to white, so we're out of roll. We're up for Q&A, questions and answers, tips and tricks. And we're going to get back into the discussion um, if anybody has further you know, comments about the role plays in general. But one thing I just want to say, and I, it's in the materials, but I want to make sure that everybody understands this. Uh, first of all, by the way, I, I, was remi I am remiss right now in not thanking the one person here who did a absolutely phenomenal job and a true tour de force, considering that he was sick, um, just so everybody knows, with bronchitis for the past two weeks. And he ended up rehearsing with us for about three hours. He's still getting over it. And that's our mediator, Nelson Timken, did pneumonia. an absolutely phenomenal job. So congratulations. I would have been it's happy with bronchitis. It was pneumonia. Uh, no, oh, sorry, <laughs> pneumonia. Yes. I, I, I got my, my uh, maladies. <coughs> double pneumonia, right, Nelson, if I remember correctly? Yeah, pneumonia. but I'm getting over it. Thank God. Thank God. So that, yeah. that's the first thing. And second of all, none of, as I put it in the materials, None of what you've seen over here tonight was scripted at all. The only person who knew anything about the uh, most probably controversial scenario that we had, uh, the one that's probably going to be talked about for some time, which was the matter of trust court annex, was uh, Federica, only with respect to what I showed her. I didn't even discuss it with her. None of the panelists had any input uh, in encouraging me to come up with that scenario. If there's any criticism or what else, 
level it at me. I'm the one who's responsible for drafting all of these uh, materials and what else. The panelists are here to basically be in the same environment, experience the same realism of what was uh, going on. Uh, again, Chuck did point out a lot of these things were done for pedagogical purposes to give people an exposure to the extremes of what happens in both contexts, not necessarily something that you discuss in, in training. Uh, because there's only so much we could discuss in training, and obviously you can't go through everything. But this is something that you just get from real life uh, experiences is, is brought out, um, as interpreted by me and as interpreted by other people. I also want to give a, a quick shout out now to Chris, uh, Federica, and uh, Dorothy. Even though she her video had a problems tonight, the, Dorothy was uh, <laughs> certainly still still present, especially in, in the last scenario. All of them really put in a ton of time with me in uh, coming to this, as well as all the panelists. We spent probably a total together uh, of a combined at least 300 hours of putting uh, this together in terms of everybody's time. So uh, thank you to all. All right. Alon, so can I yes. just interrupt? Sure. Um, now, Steve and Simeon, you have your program coming up, correct? Yes. Yes. And I want to tell everyone, if you enjoyed this, one of the best trainings that I ever took that really helped me greatly was the training in commercial mm -hmm. mediation by Simeon Baum and Steve Hockman. And I can't, uh, I can't recommend it enough to all of you. And it's coming up. Do you guys want to give the dates? Yeah. Um, Nelson, that's so kind of you. And, and uh, true. You know, it's it's amazing that you know to hear you say that. Thank you very much. It's the dates of this is this is a training that was designed for the commercial division media um, back uh, in the mid '90s. Steve and I started doing the training uh, when we were both on the advisory group for um, uh, Judge Crane was the administrative judge for the commercial division uh, ADR uh, program, and um, it was three days. And then we expanded to five days when, when the rules changed and required that. So the first three-day program, which is actually the integrated original three-day program, so it's it's got substantive elements, you know, focused on commercial as well as basic process elements, but it's called the basic commercial training. That is um, March 15th through 17th, uh, given through uh, the New York State Bar Association. We are still saying that it is going to be held at Fordham Law School in person. Let's hope, um, let's hope. <laughs> and we are keeping fingers crossed, but uh, we frankly haven't, even Fordham can't commit to it uh, at this stage. And who knows, you know, everyone, uh, you know, is uncertain. And then uh, following that, uh, we'll have the two day, uh, what's called advanced commercial uh, mediation training. Um, and that one, um, I'm wondering if we've actually. Yeah, it's June something or other. It, it is May, actually. Steve. Oh, May, you're right. It's it's May 17th and 18th. So um, it is good if people want to be on the commercial uh, division panel. This is the training that's required for that panel. If people have had Part 146 approved basic training, then people could take just the, the two day advanced training. If people uh, have had the uh, basic training and take the three-day training, that still counts as the advanced training from a substantive standpoint. So either of them is interchangeable as, as so-called advanced. Uh, and uh, and yet all together is the five days that's required. For I recommend taking uh, all five days, all five. And, I, I, and hopefully we'll, uh, you all would be, Hopefully, you will be willing to be coaches. We need a lot of coaches, and it's a great way to uh, participate in the program as well. And I, I got to say, this was amazing. This program, I, 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 it was, I just can't, can't thank you enough for, for the way you put this together. And it was so real. I mean, it was, it, it was. It, it wasn't all scripted. It was. Um, the word is verisimilitude. That's that's was, that's what we're going for. <laughs> cinema, cinema verite, verisimilitude. All except Thank for you, you Elon. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. All except for me. I, I was certainly overdoing a little bit. 
I want to just uh, go to some of the questions that we, uh, you know, or comments that people put in the question and answer just what we have over here. So I'll, I'm going to knock out, uh, you know, the first two and then I'll open up the other ones to, uh, to everybody else. So Richard Lutterniger, uh, again, uh, uh, thank you, Richard, you know, for coming on. He's been at MMO Meteors Meeting Online. We've had that uh, program going for some time. He's also been to some of our meetings before. Um, so thank you for attending. Having skipped the uh, mediator's introduction, the most critical opportunity to set expectations of the parties to tone and matter of treatment the other side. Yes, it is a critical opportunity, but um, sometimes even with ground rules and in my mediation agreement, which by the way is much longer than Nelson's, it's about a 14 page agreement, which has a good number of ground rules as the spec expectations and tones. And I have a pre-mediation conference. I still find that people violate the rules and you still end up having you know, pushback, not as much as we've seen tonight, you know, for doing that. But over over time, my experience has led me to craft such a long uh, mediation agreement for from that side. Point. OK, next question. Anonymous attendee asks, what do you all think if opposing counsel makes it clear and announces they are willing to pay a premium in legal fees along with offering a low amount in mediation? You know what? I've heard this before. My point is to test that with that opposing counsel's client. If you are able to get the same person who's really paying the bills uh, on, on ground over here and they, they don't flinch and what else, it means that you could have your opposing counsel having complete control of them. But uh, my view is, again, without creating a wedge, you know, this is a point that Alita brought out before, without creating a wedge between the attorney and client, see if you could craftily and maybe not directly see if, if really the client, uh, the opposing counsel's client is on board with that. Uh, and certainly in a case of a corporate client, uh, make sure that, that really they have the authority. There are occasions when attorneys get just a little bit too gung-ho about their cases and exceed the authority that even their clients have, and then suddenly they have to eat humble pie. All right, next question. I'm going to throw this one out to everybody. There's a whole bunch from uh, uh, Eric Van Ginkle. Yeah, there we go. I got the right name. We're the third one down there, so thank you for uh, correcting your name. He writes, uh, first question, I use a midpoint in the process where I feel the people have said enough about what happens. Let's now focus on the future. Are you willing to make concessions to resolve your dispute? Did you make a calculation of the cost of continuing the litigation, the cost of experts, et cetera? So this is basically reality testing and risk analysis. How do you think we can resolve the dispute? What is your BATNA best uh, alternative to negotiated agreement? Your WATNA worst alternative to negotiated agreement? Your MALATNA most likely alternative to negotiated agreement? Yeah, those are all great questions, um, certainly to ask. They're certainly part of any you know, reality testing and what else. I don't think there was more of a, a question than what exploring what I think, what about exploring interest items? I was told by one of his colleagues that Roger Fisher, uh, that's uh, for those people who may not be familiar, he's the person who wrote, uh, amongst other people, Getting to Yes, and a bunch of other books from the Harvard Negotiation Project. Uh, Roger Fisher was invited to come to California to assist in a mediation that was in an impasse. Granted, this was a contract matter, but at times it also works in pure tort cases. He reportedly asked the question, is there anything the other party has that you would be interested in having rights to? Now, this is a point that actually I wanted to bring up. Similar questions could be useful to introduce an interest-based negotiation. I'm going to open the floor up to that in a second. But one thing that I just wanted to point out was this, and this is directed to Nelson. And again, Nelson, to the extent that I came at you with, with something which was underhanded and what else, I'm going to say right now, I apologize. Um, it's not really my personality to be like that and what else. I hope everybody realizes that. But I was doing it for pedagogical purposes and hopefully to make you more immune to sort of inoculate you using a COVID analogy in that regard. But one thing I thought which maybe you might want to as a mediator come to discuss was uh, something actually which is in your Norval Settle article that you gave to us with all the 82 tips for breaking impasse. It's part of the materials along with many other phenomenal pieces uh, contributed by our panelists. But one of the things that he asked uh, you know, people to, who are mediators to, in finding impasse to, to recognize is whether or not there are non-monetary variable, variables in play. And to the extent that you find non-monetary variables in the situation, you may be able to exploit them to substitute in place of monetary variables. So um, uh, just very quickly, Gerald, do you have, is there anything I need to do to verify attendance? Can you just sign out? I believe you could just sign out because your attendance is recorded automatically. Um, but just to, to going back to the distinction, in going back to all the role plays, a possible workaround, all right, here, and it's something way back at the beginning of the fact pattern, all right, and I dropped it, but it was something that did cross my mind in the context of the negotiations. Keep in mind, in real life, this was not a mediation, this was a negotiation, all right? But one of the things that I discussed uh, at the time with my client uh, was the idea that he had a connection to an architect. 
The architect in this case was his father, who helped build the buildings. Architects have potential connections to other plumbing jobs. So one thing that went through my mind, didn't ultimately pan out in terms of the negotiations, one thing that was going through my mind was to perhaps leverage my client's father's connections to other builders and other buildings to get plumbing jobs that would ultimately serve to reduce the balance which would be owed to give SPI more business because SPI happened to be suffering as a result of the pandemic as well. By the way, that's the answer as to why they brought the case so late. They yeah. brought the case where they really had, a, from what, what I got from them, I don't know if I got the entire picture, but it, they ended up bringing the case because they got to the point where they had many accounts receivable outstanding from COVID and they were had their backs against the wall, much as Zena Zorba had her backs against the wall with respect to um, the case that was going on. So that's the thing for that. Alita, yeah, go ahead. It, it, Alana, it, it's also common in construction where, particularly on smaller projects, you know, you're dealing with, say, less than $2 million for the whole project, that, you know, a subcontractor or contractor will, will, will be in dialogue with whoever owes the money, whether it's a subcontractor to the, the GC or the GC to the owner, uh, and promises of payment will be made. And sometimes when those promises are made uh, verbally, uh, an explanation will say, I'm just waiting on money to come from X source and then I'll pay you. And what will happen is a, a party doesn't want to litigate, but they'll pull the trigger as soon as they feel like they've been strung along for too long. Um, and that raises interesting questions then, um, you'd be interested in, in Alita's thoughts, on when those sorts of cases get thrown into court annexed mediation, it's, it, there's a lot of frustration already from the plaintiff's side about feeling like they've been strung along. Uh, and this is just another, another part of being strung along in the, in the process. Um, I guess just talking about the the likelihood of success in a mediation and of being able to settle it. I had in my notes a lot actually what you had said the relationship with the um, with the owner's father as an architect and even aside from the idea of future business, the relationship between the father and the and the contractor and was that worth preserving and how does that get thrown into the mix because if it is something even on a personal level that matters to the contractor, then maybe they're willing to be more flexible because of the value of that relationship. And so that's something that could have been explored. I realized there was no time for that and you weren't really focused so much on the substantive aspects of it, but it's a way to broaden the pie, so to speak, and to think about other interests and other things that matter to the parties, which is all intended to get them to not only come to a resolution, but to be more flexible in getting there. Oh, one thing that I learned from Kenny Feinberg before he became famous was he used to ask the parties, uh, do you want me to charge my regular rate or do you want the premium discount where, where I get a premium if, if it settles and I give you a discount if it doesn't? And actually, I had somebody say, you know, I'm... I'm willing to pay more if it works. So it's it, it's something that um, there's nothing wrong with that. And uh, um, so I, I just throw that out as something that that uh, may happen. Uh, and it it, uh, it anyway, it's 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 something you can think about, and there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, so, well, Steve, so since you touched on that, there actually could be something of an issue with respect to mediator ethics if you're taking some sort of contingent fee on the outcome of the case. Um, and this is not for this program. It's going to be for a future program where we're discussing mediator compensation, compensation schemes. Yeah. But there are, are many different many different bar associations and as well as uh, organizations that specifically raise causes for concern. In fact, if I remember correctly, Hawaii is coming into my head for some reason. Uh, and Hawaii uh, court materials, they specifically have said that there are differing views on contingency-based fees. And th there are some people who say that it's perfectly fine, like you were saying. Other people say that, unfortunately, it creates too much of a conflict within the mediator to drive towards a, a specific outcome, and it tempers up with their neutrality. So well, you can't is, have you can't have a percentage of what it settles for. That you can't do. Right. But but it's okay. still a settlement. It's still a settlement-driven incentive. Correct. And and the challenge for people who might be uncomfortable with that, 
uh, is is twofold or multiple, but it, it includes uh, that. For one thing, do we even want to make a statement that we're motivated according to the rate? But if we are going to be motivated according to the rate, if the rate does matter, then should we be pushed, you know, hungry for a settlement, even if the parties want a settlement, even both of them want to settle, each one wants a settlement, should the mediator as a neutral be pushed for settlement to the point where they might press for settlement that's not in, not just in the best interest of the party, but really where, where they're pressuring a party to, to settle, where perhaps that party might, in, in an exercise of self-determination, say, you know what, I'd rather duke it out in court. I'd rather defer. I don't want to settle under these terms. And they get pressured into it because the meter is going to get paid. Them. Even if that's not really what's going on, do we want the appearance that that's what's going on? So there's, there are challenges with that approach. Since Steve, since you raise it, you know, and and uh, Alon has, uh, you know, identified some of the, you know, other views on it. Um, I want to say something before, before, and I'll, we can get back to this, Chuck, but before the time runs out, because I see we're, you know, uh, you know, Alon uh, thanked all kinds of people. There's two people, I don't know if they were thanked, but I think should be added to the list, who were amazing and have done amazing work. And that's Barry Chase. Uh, and and uh, Daler uh, Rajabov, Rajabov, and, and Simeon, and and Dallaire's staff. Dallaire has a whole bunch of people who work under him, who are completely in the background. You would never see them. One of them is James Wilson. You just happen to know that from for a different reason. But it's Dallaire's staff as well. Yeah. So so who we were there throughout made this thing possible. And in addition, you know, from the standpoint of panelists who get to be here and just you know chatter. Um, you know, Alan, you for putting that thing together, a uh, massive set of uh, materials, uh, as well as uh, to, you know, Nelson uh, for the bravery, among other things, of being the media throughout this program uh, and the endurance to, to suffer the abuse at the hands of Alan. Uh, and to Chris, uh, who, who himself, uh, you know, played the role of advocate, but as a media you know, uh, you know, I think, you know, and just to, you know, we're thanking everybody, but, you know, the, the actors were fantastic. But I just, I wanted to add that. Thank you so uh, much, uh, Cynthia. Chuck, I, go I ahead, you got something. Yeah. I, uh, I, I wanted to, first of all, I, I think all the names have been named, uh, but no one knows better than the commentators how much work went into this uh, and, and the That's fact that it came off and the fact that the CLE department, everyone in the CLE department pulls this stuff off time and time again, as if, as if it were a natural thing to have happen. It's just an amazing amount of work that went into this program. And I congratulate all the people who, not including me, who put their uh, a tremendous amount of work into what turned out to be a great job. The, the, what I wanted to interrupt about was that Crystal Thorpe put a question in the Q&A, which has disappeared, so you didn't see it, Alon, um, because I replied to it um, uh, saying, can you hang around for the after party so I can tell you then? Crystal wanted to know what else Steve Hockman says that I quote. Uh, and the horse Steve Hockman is here, so we could get it right from his own mouth. There are three things that I quote him all the time. One of them was, thank you for telling me your current thinking about your final position. Um, I, I, I'm forgetting the third. But the second one is um, when asked in how many of his commercial mediations, um, emotion has something to do with the outcome. Steve answers, give or take 100 percent of the time. And I just love that phrase, give or take 100 percent of the time, because it means sometimes it's more than 100 percent. <laughs> so, Chris, the third, the I, third I, shock I is patience and waiting. perseverance. And Steve, you're the, here. What other, what other pearls do you the, have? The have? third is patience and perseverance, right? Uh, it was, I say, the six most important qualities of mediation is patience, perseverance is the first two, patience and perseverance is the second two. And you know, what the third, it's like location, location, location. And in real estate, it's it's uh, that's the name of the game is never give up uh, because if you don't give up, you'll end up with a settlement. Um, I'd like to present one closing editorial comment on, on tonight's 
show and uh, you know one set of observations. Um, with with many thanks to the participants, the the role players, and and everyone who was involved in, in creating this uh, presentation. Um, there is this uh, potential uh, where you've got an intense layering of problems that are presented during this role play to, to get a runaway show. Uh, it, it could lead us to see uh, mediation as a bedlam um, or think that there's a frenzy of challenges that put the mediator in, in a spot of great struggle and, and possibly the need to arm wrestle with counsel of the parties. So having um, done uh, 2,000 mediations in the last 30 years, uh, fortunately, however difficult matters uh, might, might uh, be, I know my observation is we, we don't encounter the, the kind of impasse that tonight took off from the earth uh, into the realm of the entertaining collage of uh, impasse generating issues. Uh, that we just witnessed uh, in the form of a, of a recalcitrant and, uh, and somewhat incensed attorney. So for, for mediations in, in real time, we're typically given enough time and the opportunity to connect with our fellow human beings on a human level uh, with the benefit of time so, so that we don't have to be snagged with impasse. So one closing piece or set of observations, uh, 25 years ago, as, as Nelson Timken remarked, uh, NICLA hosted uh, an online, not an online, actually in-person uh, evening program, um, impasse breaking techniques uh, in mediation. And I had at that time the, the good fortune of serving as the moderator. I, I was somewhat you know, new to the field. And, and was able to bring in um, great mediators, uh, Margaret Shaw, Leela Love, Roger Dietz, Kathy Roberts. We had a, a terrific program chair, Amy Rothstein. Um, and each of the mediators presented their you know, uh, technique for getting past uh, impasse. But since I was the, uh, the moderator, I got a chance to put in my own two cents. And basically my core point was, there's something bigger than, than any technique um, that leads to impasse. Um, and what that is, is something in, in the character and presence of the mediator, him or herself. Uh, and in connection with that uh, point, you know, I drew on a Chinese classic from 2,500 years ago from the Taoist tradition called the Tao Te Ching. Uh, and basically the message is we're all in this world together. We're at this table uh, together, participating in something much bigger than ourselves. Uh, and the mediator's ability to communicate this and related messages in words, non-verbally, um, and, and beyond that, in, in the mediator's very way of being, in, in the vision, in who the mediator is, uh, that has much more impact uh, on enabling parties to engage in a process that builds understanding and deal making uh, than any particular uh, technique, tactic, or, or, or move. So uh, thank you, Nelson, for having mentioned the piece, which is in your materials. The, the full name of it is uh, Technique of No Techniques, a pay into the data chain, penultimate word and breaking impasse or something like that. Uh, and it's, it's from a, a book Molly Clapper did for the state bar you know, when we first formed the dispute resolution section, uh, she called it definitive creative impasse breaking techniques. Um, so, you know, look, the mediator's style uh, is as varied as there are mediators. And in fact, even more so because mediators themselves, you know, do different things over, and behave in different ways over time. So Steve Hockman, for instance, might love, you know, or prefer a phrase like, let me see what I can get from the other side because it, it, it shows in a caucus, you know, it shows the party you're talking with and you're kind of working for them uh, and also um, can uh, avoid reactive devaluation. It's something the mediator is doing as opposed to something the other party is, is, uh, is pushing. But others might not be so comfortable with that, where the mediator's 
putting themselves forward as the actor, uh, making himself the star or the you know agent for the other parties vis-a-vis the others. Similarly, you know, some mediators prefer first names to expressions like sir or counselor, um, and, and use those names with you know, the party's permission and respectfully. Uh, and this is a way uh, we can humanize. Uh, also, you know, statements that sound like uh, pronouncements or exhortations, you know, however wise, um, people might, some people might steer away from that, de- preferring to demonstrate it rather than to sound like you're kind of, you know, the wise person, you know, in a superior status, you know, relative to the other parties. So this technique of no techniques piece that uh, Nelson cites uh, observes that there's like a core message for us in the mediation field, that there's a power in an attitude that puts parties first. In a conflict resolution forum, there's a trust deficit, not only between and among the parties, but also as we saw tonight, you know, with, with counsel too. Um, but the mediator come in and fill that trust deficit with an attitude of trust uh, and send the message you know, as you look around the table, we're all here, uh, people of goodwill and capacity who can and will address what it is that's brought us here uh, and work it out. So the mediator has this power to communicate really a transcendent uh, realization that there's something greater, bigger uh, than all of us in which we participate. We're embedded in it. And that with time and patience, uh, this greater reality with all of us together, uh, is going to open a way for us to be able to work it out. You know, we could look at this in religious terms and talk about it as, uh, you know, the, the Tao in a great way, or, you know, God or um, truth, or, or you could just look at it as reality. Um, but basically, it's, it's that there's a movement towards reconciliation and peace. In pragmatic or psychological or sociological terms, um, you know, it's just the realization that discord just hurts too much. Resolution feels better. Uh, and, and also things like the cost of litigation, disruption, uncertainty, the need to move on, and more, you know, these things combine to generate resolutions. Now, I'll say, based on you know, my observations, mediations, all kinds of shapes and sizes, uh, personalities, uh, interpersonal and financial challenges, it, it, seems, it seems to be valid. Having a deep calm with a basis in silence and deep listening, the cultivation of an awareness uh, of what's happening within oneself and in others uh, and a continuous relatedness coupled with deep flexibility so you're not confronting, you're not preaching, you're not you know, making pronouncements, but you're recognizing the humanity of all the players at the table uh, and outside the room. Um, you're being genuine uh, and, and in fact normal uh, and preserving this quality of deep listening, this way of being and, and living uh, you know, with myself and others in the world, uh, opens a field for everybody, all the participants, to grow together and understand. So with this, we can bypass many of the snags that were acted out in, in tonight's program. Uh, one by one, the mediator can catch that moment of escalation before eruption and apply the appropriate sound or fix. Um, sometimes, it's with listening, sometimes uh, it's with acknowledgement, sometimes it's addressing, sometimes it's, it's looking past to something else, demurring essentially, uh, and reorienting the talk into a productive zone. So close with this message, really to ensure that the high level of entertainment with the smorgasbord of challenges presented in this really delightful role play doesn't leave the viewer with the impression that mediation is a place of radical conflict uh, and wild abandon. Um, hope you've enjoyed the show and that you're going to find after uh, this uh, tonight's slugfest 
uh, that you've been given a ton of challenges that give you a year's worth uh, of rumination. So thank you, Alon, uh, for this in particular, and, and thank you, Nelson, uh, for braving that assault so uh, unflappably. All right. Well, this was a great program, really. You guys, it was amazing. It, it was it was just fantastic, and and uh, you did a fantastic job. And, oh, I learned, and I learned so much. I always learn because I didn't know it was ten years that it's on your record when you go bankrupt. I mean, I, I'm always learning law too. It's always what I say is, uh, what's the evidence? Uh, supporting your position? Is there an eyewitness or what are the cases that support your position? And as, uh, as Nelson always said, I'm on your side, uh, but I'm also on your side. I'm on both of your sides or I'm, I'm on nobody's side or I'm on both of your sides because we're on the side of the deal, as, as they say. So it was really great. You did a great job. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much again. It was, uh, Pleasure working with you all. Another wonderful program, but one which uh, we had a ton of fun, I think, doing. And I hope uh, certainly gave people a, a new perspective on uh, the environment of ADR as we have it, specifically with uh, private mediation and court annex mediation, and that they got something out of this program. And, uh, and I, just... I will mention everybody in my Oscar acceptance speech. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to say our wonderful panel yes. for providing wonderful uh, tips and critiques. I want to thank everybody for coming. And I just want to say God bless and stay well, everybody. Stay thank safe you. and be well. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.